terrorist group Hamas. Anti-Semitism grew to levels I have never seen in my lifetime, on social media and off of it. Neighborhood Canada recorded a 54% increase in violent incidents in May 2021 over the same period in 2020, many of which started online. In fact, during this period, I personally witnessed anti-Semitic activists driving on Kildare Road in the city of Cote St. Luke in my district, threatening to harm Jews. For the first time as an elected official, I had Jewish constituents who were afraid to send their children to the park, and people asking me if they should remove the mezuzahs from their doors. Attacks occurred in New York, in Los Angeles. In Las Vegas, a Jewish man was assaulted by a stranger who said that Jews are baby killers and are not going to exist. In Sydney, Australia, in Sydney, Australia speakers at an anti-Israel protest called out for violence against Jews, yelling things like, destroy the Jews and give us the necks of the Jews. This rise in anti-Semitism has not been confined to North America and Australia. I'm certain all my colleagues here today have stories that are similar from their countries. Hate and disinformation targeting Jewish communities online knows no borders. But despite the widespread proliferation of anti-Semitism online, social media platforms either can't or won't keep up with a tactical evolution of bad actors. At the moment, platform efforts appear to be a whack-a-mole of ad hoc content removal, followed by tactical evolution and circumvention. Moderation approaches have been wildly inconsistent, particularly in non-English speaking jurisdictions. Rather than simply being an issue of removing content, this challenge comes down to the fundamental business models of the platforms and the algorithmic systems underpinning their products. As my friend said, this is why we need algorithm transparency. Each of our countries, like all democracies around the world, are grappling with urgent questions about how governments can protect social cohesion, democratic processes, and public safety online while protecting critical rights and freedoms. It is imperative that we work across borders to pursue a new policy paradigm to counter online anti-Semitism. The work of the task force has clearly shown that the self-regulation of platforms have been insufficient to effectively combat anti-Semitism online, and the need for legislative action is clear. Our traditional understanding of free speech is based on a public square concept, where speech is balanced by counter speech, bad idea by good idea. This does not exist on social media today where algorithms steer people into echo chambers. Policy approaches must incentivize online platforms to prioritize our fundamental values, democracy and human rights, not profit. Safety must be a prerequisite for market access, as it is in many other industries. However, a unilateral approach is not the solution. To achieve our shared goals, parliamentarians must plat partner with platforms and civil society and our ambassadors and special envoys as we craft and implement these policies. And we must do so in a cohesive way across jurisdictions. Finally, and I will be getting to this in my questions to the platform, it is crucial that we are better informed in our understanding of the scale and nature of anti-Semitism online. Regulation must ensure that civil society, media, and regulators have greater access to social media data, which is essential for building the evidence base around online hate and providing independent scrutiny of platforms. As well as allowing a more complete understanding of company policies, procedures, and enforcement, this data is crucial to achieve real-time and multi-sector response and mitigation of emerging anti-Semitic threats. In conclusion, I would just like to mention how grateful we are to the special envoys and social media platforms for being here today. We know you did not have to be here platforms, and I really appreciate the collaborative effort. We have much important work to accomplish together. Thank you so much, Mr. Housefather. Now I'd like to re recognize our other task force co-chair, our co-founder, a former member of the Israeli Knesset, my friend, Ms. Michal cutler wanch from Israel. You're out for five minutes. Thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and uh, thank you very much to the co-chairs, to you, to yourself, and to Anthony Housefather from the Canadian Parliament. Over the last several years, there's been an alarming increase that we've heard about in anti-Semitic incidents across the globe. Today, the apparent majority originate online as part of the larger hate and disinformation campaign seen on both mainstream and dark web platforms. <coughs> research shows that anti-Semitic tropes, memes, and rhetoric are often incorporated in other online conspiracy theories, with a Swedish expert recently on combating, combating anti-Semitism recently stating that at the core of the threat to liberal democracy is anti-Semitism, labeling anti-Semitism online as the mother of conspiracy theories. 
This hate scene online is not just harmless chatter relegated to the dark corners of the internet. It spills onto campuses and into the streets, fueling dangerous propaganda that transcends the geographic borders of any countries. Combating this global hatred requires a global solution. Further, the case and cause of online anti-Semitism presents an opportunity and responsibility for digital platforms, policymakers, special envoys, and civil society to together examine the problem and create a comprehensive solution and recommendations, legislation and institutions that can be utilized in the broader context of addressing online hate, conspiracy, and disinformation that so distrust and translate into real harm and violence. In July 2020, the No Safe Space for Jew Hate campaign took place, serving as a global call to action to combat the virulent anti-Semitism that goes unaddressed or inadequately, inadequately addressed on social media platforms. Growing urgency led to my initiating and leading four hearings in Israel's 23rd Knesset, in which social media giants, civil society organizations, and technology experts engaged to identify and understand the problem and to discuss possible solutions. Subsequently, this interparliamentary task force to combat online anti-Semitism was launched together with multi-partisan partners from the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia. The task force has since grown to include additional members serving as a consistent voice committed to protecting all from online hate, underscoring that the fight against anti-Semitism is a non-partisan consensus. Transcending real and perceived differences of geography, politics, religion, language, and more, the task force works to establish consistent, consistent messaging and policy from parliaments and legislatures around the world to hold social media platforms, including Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Google accountable, to advocate for the adoption and publication of transparent policies related to hate speech and their consistent application, to raise awareness about anti-Semitism on social media platforms and its consequences in order to acknowledge the tremendous responsibility that comes with the power that the platforms hold, and to emphasize that if one minority cannot be protected by hate speech policies and their detailed protected characteristics, ultimately, none can. The Task Force 2021 Interim Report central recommendations were that national, state, provincial, local governments, as well as social media providers, should adopt a clear definition of anti-Semitism for without first defining a problem, we cannot identify or combat it. Further, social media platforms should enhance transparency regarding algorithms, how content is removed, what content is removed, and what <coughs> tools are used to direct users to certain sites or redirect users away from, from hate or, and or harms and provide regular quarterly reports on these issues. It is important that social media actually be a marketplace of ideas and that individuals are not simply directed to content that reinforces existing opinions. Legislators should create an independent oversight body or regulator in each country to efficiently, regularly, and transparently monitor the online space. As the international consensus definition established after years of democratic process and adopted by hundreds of entities, including countries, cities, sports leagues, corporations, the International Holocaust Remember Alliance, IRA's working definition, is the logical and recommended definition of anti-Semitism for social media giants to turn to as well. This comprehensive working definition critically enables, as Canada's former justice minister and current anti-Semitism anti special envoy, Professor Erwin Kotler explains, to track the mutation from its traditional form, barring the individual Jew from an equal place in society, to the mainstreamed modern form, barring the Jewish nation state from an equal place among the nations. The late Elie Wiesel underscored that the Holocaust did not begin in gas chambers, it began with words, and that the hate being spewed online today against the Jewish people and their nation state is something of significant concern. Online hate has learned that referring to killing Jews will trigger an algorithm to remove the content, but calling for death to Zionists, regardless of the fact this description represents the majority of Jews, is somehow acceptable. That is why Zionist, a component part of many Jews' identities, must be added to social media platforms' list of protected categories. Without this, hate against the majority of Jews, as well as non-Jews who self-define as Zionists, is allowed to fester online, simply referred to as saber rattling. The continued task force discussions we are holding today recognize that we have a shared responsibility to work together in order to identify and combat this mutating hate in our midst and to stop the downward spiral of anti-Semitic vitriol. The imperative to raise the public's awareness to digital information, dissemination, and to the fact we are not necessarily consumers in the current digital platform business model, rather sometimes the product, assumes and reclaims compromised free will and agency at a time of supposed ultimate freedom and agency. These hearings are not about blame. They are a call to action to legislators, tech giants, envoys, civil society, and the general public 
to engage and hone the ability and responsibility of our generation to ensure that humanity continues to evolve and develop, gathering necessary tools to address the fundamental changes in the way we all consume information, while ensuring that the spread of conspiracy theories, of which anti-Semitism is but a predictive example, does not collapse the entire shared infrastructure. Knowing the real world harm that bullies and excludes Zionists from equal access and, and participation in university book clubs and support groups for victims of sexual harassment in classes is an unacceptable reality. The mutation of anti-Semitism enabled by the appropriation and weaponization of foundational principles to demonize, delegitimize, and apply double standards to, uh, and apply double standards to Israel, the three Ds, finds multidimensional escalating expressions. In a blurred boundary reality, they manifest on digital platforms and on the streets, peddling and echoing modern renditions of an ancient toxic anti-Semitic tropes as defined in the IRA definition that includes, as it must, the three Ds if it is to fulfill its role to <coughs> comprehensively identify and combat anti-Semitism. The trigger for the creation of the IRA definition, a non-legally binding resource, was the 2001 Durban Conference Against Racism, the pretext for what became an anti-Semitic hate fest a milestone in the systematic appropriation of human rights to advance and conflate Israel with apartheid South Africa. A mutation of the 1975 Zionism is Racism UN resolution revoked decades later, it is part of the recognition that where conventional warfare failed, a war for hearts and minds implementing a systematic strategy can gain traction. Appropriating Zionism, a 140-year-old progressive national liberation movement built on a millennia-old identity integral to the character, heritage, and ancestry of Jews worldwide, most of whom identify as Zionists, has rendered their identity synonymous with the gravest of human crimes, enabling to legitimately include it in the list of isms, excluding and denying Zionists from equal access, rights, or participation in digital and real spaces, in order to ensure equal access to opportunity, safety, and protection from harm for all, including those who identify as Zionist, and regard it as an integral part of their identities, it must be added to the existing detailed list of protected characteristics in the social media platform's hate policies. It is vital that the platforms take responsibility to identify and remove fake accounts and that, that use them to disseminate disinformation. Further, it is critical to create external audit mechanisms increasing transparency of platform policies and their application as an antidote to growing distrust that threatens the fabric of societies ensuring safety and protection from harm is extended to all equally and consistently. Selective application or any appearance of double standards not only fails to protect one category, but undermines the entire infrastructure to protect all categories. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now welcome our first panel, composed of special envoys to combat anti-Semitism from around the world. Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism from the United States. Canadian Special Envoy Erwin Kotler, Organization of American States Commissioner Fernando Lautenberg, and Israeli Special Envoy Noah Tishby. All panelists will be given five minutes for their opening statement, and I'll begin by recognizing Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt for five minutes. Ambassador. Thank, thank you, Representative uh, Wasserman Schultz. It's an honor to be here. I'm honored to speak to all of you on this important subject. But first, I want to thank both you, uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, and your co-chair, uh, Anthony, a member of Parliament's House Father, uh, for convening everyone here to discuss this truly critical topic. As many of you know, before I started my position at the State Department, I was a historian and a university professor. Some people question how smart I was to give that up, but we can, that's, that's for another conversation. So if you will indulge me, I'd like to put on my university regalia once more. As a historian, I look for trends, but it doesn't take a historian to notice the growing trend we are here to address, a trend we are all witnessing, which should be of the utmost concern to all governments. Anti-Semitism, commonly accepted as the world's oldest hatred. These days, we see classic age-old anti-Semitic tropes online and elsewhere with increasing frequency, including rhetoric from government leaders and public figures, implying outside Jewish control of national, regional, and even global matters. We also see increased physical manifestations of anti-Semitism across the world, marchers carrying Nazi, Nazi symbols and parades, people painting swastikas on synagogues or near Jewish sites, and violent attacks, physical attacks, on Jews in the streets of major cities, including New York, my own home, my own 
birthplace. But the spread of anti-Semitism is also changing and manifesting in new and uncomfortable ways, and that's the reason that what the reason that brings you here today. Much of it is because Jew haters are now operating in online spaces. As with other forms of hate, as you heard from a number of our speakers already, anti-Semitism is on the rise. According to the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, between January 2020 and March 2021, Twitter, Facebook, and Telegram saw a 700% increase in anti-Semitic posts in France. In Germany, the same platform saw a 1,300% increase, 1,300%. The ADL reports that in the United States, 36% of Jews report ex experiencing anti-Semitic harassment online in 2021. Anti-Semitism ev is everywhere. It's in the sweet streets and it's in the tweets. As Americans, when we talk about how to address hate online, we remain mindful of the protections of the First Amendment of which I am, as I, I think my fellow Americans here are, staunch advocates. Not just because I now represent the United States government, but, but because of my own personal experiences. When I was sued for libel by Holocaust denier David Irving, he tried to infringe on my freedom of speech. He tried to silence me. He demanded that my books be trashed. Freedom of speech is a, is a cornerstone of American democracy, although it is subject to certain limits. The American view is that the answer to even more hideous, bigoted, and hateful speech is not censor, but more speech. The idea being that the best ideas will ultimately win out against the small-minded speech of those who peddle hatred. That is why we can and must call out and condemn and counter anti-Semitism wherever and whenever we see it. However, I'm not so naive as to believe the same strategies that served us well in the past are fully sufficient to counter this rising trend. When I began to study anti-Semitism, as I told some of you last night, and specifically Holocaust denial, if I wanted to read related materials where people had engaged in Holocaust denial, I had to order those materials in, and they arrived in a plain envelope to a P.O. box. No one wanted to be tracked, and of course, if the post office tracked you, they stopped it. But now, with social media and other online platforms, all one has to do is type in a few words, type in Anne Frank's diary, not even Anne Frank's diary is a hoax, just Anne Frank's diary, and sometimes the third or fourth thing that will come up will be a claim that it is a hoax. Um, even more concerning is that sometimes users don't even seek this kind of contact, but rather algorithms aimed at keeping the user glued to the computer screen all day, day provided to them. They can, users can inadvertently fall into black holes of disinformation. Uh, recently, David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, interviewed a, prof a professor, Barbara Walter, who uh, studies uh, uh, threats to democracy, and she told the following anecdote. She ordered the Turner Diaries, which as many of you know, is the Bible, I, with apologies to the Bible, of the uh, uh, white supremacist and uh, right -wing, far right-wing extremists. She ordered it, and right there on the same page, Amazon offered her a selection of other far-right-wing, overtly white supremacist, anti-Semitic choices. Readers who ordered this also read this, and there she could have just gone down uh, that rabbit hole. Now Amazon is taken. After January 6th, Amazon took down uh, the Turner Diary. She had this experience in uh, December, right before the January 6th attack. Um, there are too many instances, and I know you've ex you've know of them, of people falling down this rabbit hole. Before they know it, they spend 15, 12, 15, 20 hours consuming hate-filled consp hate conspiracies that they never knew existed. Radicalization to violence is happening every day, and we saw its consequences in this country in Buffalo. Uh, a young man who claimed he was, he was radicalized online, it, there may have been a home atmosphere which helped this, but he claimed that he was radicalized online. He found the zip code where he could find the most black people to go and kill, and, and he did so. But if you read his online uh, so-called manifesto, 
Uh, what drove him also was anti-Semitism. It's not to prioritize one over the other, but the two are interlocked, certainly in terms of the great replacement theory. Um, and online anti-Semitism can fuel violent extremism. When the Jew hater posts, the uninformed may listen. With each algorithm comment and the like, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracies can indoctrinate a whole new generation. Now, one of the problems with combating online hate, as you and one of the reasons you're here today, is to figure out how to do it while upholding freedom of expression and using digital technologies to respond with counter message messages. My office has benefited tremendously from amplifying some of our pol political, our di diplomatic efforts through social media. Let me give you a few examples. Just last month, Commissioner Kotari, one of the three members of the UN Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry on Israel, evo invoked in a media interview the Jewish lobby's, quote, purported control over social media and questioned whether Israel should even be a member of the UN. Ambassador, our ambassador, American ambassador to the Human Rights Council, Michelle Taylor from Atlanta, and I took to Twitter and issued a joint statement condemning these anti-Semitic remarks. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, our ambassador to the United Nations, amplified with statements on her social media account. My team and I also engaged with various interlocutors at the UN, and High Representative Miguel Moratinas publicly reaffirmed his commitment to combating anti-Semitism on Twitter. All these public actions that everybody could follow in real time resulted in an apology from UN Commission Kotari for his inappropriate and offensive language. There are real meaningful benefits of using online platforms. Uh, they can be used as a, to hold public officials to account. I often compare social media to a knife, as I told some of you last night. A knife in the hands of a killer is a weapon. A knife in the hands of a surgeon can save lives. Is it, how, it is how we use it that matters. We must remember this as we engage in these conversations. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The first thing we have to do is demand of the social media accounts that they live up to their own standards. The standards they have proclaimed, let them live up to it. That would be a great first step. We can work together to help companies strengthen the language of these policies and support them in staying true to their own values. We can work together, government, civil society, social media platforms, to try to dismantle the highways to hatred. Through the means of disseminating anti-Semitism may be changing with technology, our commitment to combat it must remain st steadfast. We must use all the mechanisms at our disposal. I know we face an uphill battle, but I am optimistic that together we can make a difference. Members of Congress and parliaments, civil societies and organizations and NGOs, tech, tech platform executives, all have a critical role to play in addressing online hatred. I'm grateful to you for your partnership, and I look forward to engaging in, an, in a productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Next, I'd like to recognize Special Envoy from Canada, Erwin Kotler, for five minutes, who is participating virtually. Thank you, Congresswoman Mayor. I begin by commending you and your co-chair, not only for convening this timely and significant forum, but for your own respective substantive and exemplary remarks this morning. I regret that I'm unable to be with you in, in person uh, so that I could be the beneficiary of this in-person encounter. Indeed, I'm reminded that when the coalition of special envoys held their first ever meeting in uh, Jerusalem on the eve of Yom HaShoah, annual audits of anti-Semitism were released, which showed the highest incidence of anti-Semitism ever recorded in the last 40 years in the United States, Canada, and elsewhere. A rising level of anti-Semitic violence and the role and responsibility of anti-online hate in animating and incentivizing this resurgent global anti-Semitism, all of which is against a 
backdrop of anti-Semitism, not only as the oldest, longest, most enduring, most lethal, and most global of hatreds, one that mutates and metastasizes over time, but one anchored in a historic, foundational, generic trope of Jews as the enemy of all that is good and the embodiment of all that is evil, reflecting and representing whatever is the zeitgeist at a particular moment in time. So when the zeitgeist was Christianity, Jews were guilty of deicide, itself mutating into the blood libel. When the zeitgeist was the Jews, <coughs> the zeitgeist was the, <coughs> at that point when we spoke about the, the situation of, of uh, Black Plague, the Jews were the poisoners of the wells, as presently with the pandemic. When it was race, Jews were non-Aryans. When it was human rights, which emerged as the new secular religion of our time, then Jews were held out as the meta human rights violator of our time. Israel is a new geopolitical anti-Christ of our time. And when we had a situation of speaking about racism itself and anti-racism became the norm. Jews were the evil white supremacists, the apologists for the white apartheid state of Israel when they were not otherwise victimized in a kind of pincer victimization as being responsible in the white replacement movement for example, for corrupting whiteness itself. And all these zeitgeist, blood libels, demonizing, dehumanizing, framing this criminal, critical mass of intersectional anti-Semitic hate online is in effect a global force multiplier of hate, distortion, and the undermining of democracies. The whole finding expression in the following contemporary dynamics, which underpin anti-Semitic hate in general and online hate in particular, which reflect and represent my own experience and findings in my first 18 months as special envoy. And for reasons of time, I will speak telegraphically and enumerate them as follows. First, the mainstreaming, normalizing, and legitimation of anti-Semitism in the political and popular culture and the internet culture and the like. Second, the globalization of hate so that what happens in London or Paris not only reverberates afterwards in New York and Miami, but actually replicates itself. So that when you had in co convoys in the UK, in the streets of the UK saying, F the Jews will rape your daughters, we had similar convoys then appearing in Toronto saying the same thing. The marginalization of the combating of anti-Semitism in the overall struggle against systemic racism with which we must be involved, whether it be systemic racism against indigenous people, blacks and people of color, Asian, Canadians, Americans, or Muslims, and, and the like. The problem, however, is that the combating of anti-Semitism within and without government in education and training marginalizes anti-Semitism, sometimes even erases anti-Semitism. And more recently, as we saw in, in Canada, a government anti-racism funding program actually provided grants to one who is engaged in anti-Semitic hate on the internet that was, in a word, beyond the pale underscoring the next dynamic, which is the laundering of anti-Semitism under the very cover of anti-racism. And we have also the weaponization and instrumentalization of anti-Semitism in the political the culture where one calls out anti-Semitism in the other's political party, but not in one's own. The correlation has been mentioned between online hate and offline hate crimes. And the ignorance, indulgence, or acquiescence of social media, for example, with respect to incitement 
to genocide, itself a crime under the Genocide Convention, whether or not acts of genocide follow, and where there is a responsibility, a legal uh, responsibility, to combat that incitement to genocide. And yet, social media providers and the like might categorize it somehow as saber rattling and the like. And so it is necessary with this, I move to a close, and references have been made to these things, but I'll just briefly, in the Canadian uh, context, a na national action plans to combat hate, including within it, the centrality of online hate. And I'm pleased here that Canada in its country pledge to the Malmo Forum on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism prioritized the combating of online hate as a singular responsibility with respect to the combating of hate as a whole and the need for legislative initiatives, codes of conduct for providers, a regulator has been mentioned and the like. Second, a global action plan to combat online hate as online hate is a borderless crime in a rules free international universe. And what is needed is oversight, accountability and action on the international level. And I would hope that the coalition of special envoys in concert with uh, the task force working together also with governments and social media providers will provide that kind of concerted action plan in that regard. Third thing here is the importance of the implementation of the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism, which is the most comprehensive, the most representative, and the most democratically adopted definition of anti-Semitism that we have and therefore at the most authoritative. And I'm pleased that the government itself of Canada has now announced that it will be combating also online hate by referencing the uh, IRA definition in its work. The understanding that anti-Semitic hate and online hate is toxic to democracies. It is the canary in the mineshaft of global evil. It is an assault on our common humanity, and it will require a global constituency of conscience for advocacy and action to combat it. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Special Envoy Kotler. Now I'll recognize Commissioner Lautenberg for five minutes, who is also participating virtually. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this important panel for inviting me to offer some remarks, especially to representatives Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Anthony Hausfather. As you know, uh, Latin America was founded and developed under the influence of counter reform, either through the setting up of tribunals or through the so called visitations, the Spanish and the Portuguese inquisitions were present and active in our region for three centuries. This obviously carried a strong influence in the local perception of the Jews. And the Inquisition expanded its scope of operations from the Iberian Peninsula to its colonial possessions, including the countries in Latin America, where it continued investigation and trying cases based on supposed breaches of Orthodox Roman Catholicism until 1821. We can affirm that this only started to show a real change 55 years ago with the Second Vatican Council and the Nostra Etate that reset the relationship of the Catholic Church and Judaism. There are records of Jewish communities established in the subcontinent since the conquistadores arrival around 1500 having arrived in different times. They were expelled by the Spanish and Portuguese kings because they would refuse to convert to Catholicism a few years before. And jumping to the issue that concerns us today, I would like to observe that we have seen, again, Jews characterized during the pandemics that were a very important issue in what relates to anti-Semitism line, Jews characterized as scapegoats. If they were accused of poisoning wells during the Middle Ages, 
now they could be held responsible for the creation and or the diffusion of the virus. I myself wrote an article in a Brazilian weekly magazine called The Virus of Prejudice in June 2020, showing how much hate speech was spread along with the COVID-19 pandemics. Old tropes based on in conspiracy theories, such as that Jews produced the virus or they spread it in many countries, uh, were very common throughout the Americas. I was a witness at the legal proceeding against a journalist that published an article in his Facebook profile with 300,000 followers that mentioned that why Israelis and Jews were not contaminated by COVID. And he asked, I quote, why would that have happened? Maybe because the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers own the pharmaceutical companies or because they sell vaccines or medicines somehow taking advantage of the situation. And last but not least, anti-vaxxers were seen wearing yellow stars in a preposterous comparison to the Holocaust victims. This composes a panel of the traditional anti-Semitism in our subcontinent that we have to add the presence of German immigrations of Nazi criminal refugees that came to Latin America after the Second World War, and we had it during the 1930s, the largest Nazi parties outside of the Reich. The Brazilian Nazi party, for instance, had 3,000 members spread on 17 states in Brazil. From the left, we also have an important addition to the prejudice against Jews that mostly related, as my predecessors have mentioned, to the state of Israel regarding its demonizations, its delegitimization, and the double standard applied to it. And when you see what happened yesterday, when President Boric of Chile refused to receive the Israeli ambassador who were at his door to deliver his credential, credentials, Uh, the motive that was alleged to postpone the meeting was that there was a child killing in Gaza. And the issue that Jews could be child killers uh, rings a bell for everybody who is in the room. And we see these old tropes recycled, applied to international politics. Uh, the third Vert vertex of the anti-Semitism in Latin America could be traced to Islamic fundamentalism. And we saw what happened in Argentina. I was with Commissioner Deborah Lipstead last July in Buenos Aires. And uh, the most serious attack in Argentinian history remains unpunished, either to the Israeli embassy or to the EMEA headquarters in 1922 and 1924. And albeit the authorship in the, of the attack was credited to the Lebanese Shiite movement Hezbollah and to Iranian government officials, so far this remains unpunished. And to add insult to injury, Prosecutor Alberto Nisman, who should go to Congress on January 1915, to share his finding, uh, findings about a memorandum of understanding to be signed between Argentina and Iran was found dead in his apartment at that very morning. And until today, we don't have a final trial in that three cases. Let me remember that the IRA in its definition of anti-Semitism explains, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of the Jews, which can be expressed as a hate of the Jews rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed at Jewish and non-Jewish individuals and or their properties, Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. On our part, in the functions that we are playing in the organization of American states, we have searched to extend the role of countries that have adopted this definition. Six of them have already done it, Argentina, Canada, Uruguay, US, and in the last months, Colombia and Guatemala signed its adoption at the headquarters of the OAS. And some of other countries such as Brazil are 
members or observers of the association. Regarding the social networks that we are examining today, I believe that our main task is to find legal alternatives to combat online hate. The debate about hate speech and its containment and regulation has been gaining new contours with the changes in the media, especially in the internet. And if it was already in the traditional media, uh, as my colleague, Ambassador Deborah Lipstead has mentioned in the countries that adopt uh, First Amendment uh, focus, which is not the case of other countries, of course, it has surely taken a new dimension in the dynamics of online communication. One way to be explored as it already happens is the signing of memorandums of understanding with social networks for civil organizations to be recognized as trusted flaggers, identifying and reporting anti-Semitic posts in order to have them monitored and removed with a fast track mechanism. Another one respecting the specificities of each national legislation would be a combination of self-regulation, which has to be more transparent, and legal regulation of social networks, either through legislation or through court decisions. 48 countries have been trying to regulate it since 2019. 24 have already approved or submitted propositions to moderate content. Maybe it's time for us to consider an international convention on the subject. I conclude with a quote of Rabbi Angela Bushdow of Central Synagogue of New York, who said during her sermon a few months ago, if you are a Jew in America, and I extend that in the Americas, and you're not feeling unsettled, then maybe you're not paying attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Special Envoy, Commissioner Lautenberg. Now, last but not, certainly not least, Special Envoy Noah Tishby for five minutes. Distinguished members, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming together from around the world to commit to this very crucial cause. To fight online anti-Semitism successfully, we need to be honest about what it is that we're actually fighting. One of the special aspects of anti-Semitism is that it is shape-shifting. It morphs, mutates, and adapts. Today, in the halls of this great democracy, we need to be clear about the shape that the vast majority of online anti-Semitism has shifted into today. And that is the extreme and fanatical demonization of Israel. Anti-Israel hatred is the oxygen that online anti-Semitism breathes. My, uh, my activism started out online back in 2010 after the events of the flotilla to Gaza. That was the first time that I saw the flood of lies, hatred, and vitriol towards Israel. I saw that facts did not matter. I saw that every horrific allegation that used to be pinned on Jews was now being pinned on Israel. The 2000 year back catalog of anti-Semitic tropes, stereotypes, and accusations has been transferred from the Jew onto the Jewish state. Author Yossi Klein Halevi has identified it perfectly. Throughout history, he said, the Jew is always used in order to describe whatever it is that's most loathsome in a society at any given moment. In the early days of Christianity, the Jew was the Christ killer. Under Nazism, the Jew was the ultimate race polluter. In the days of communism, the Jew was the capitalist pig, or the communist, depends on who you're asking. The Jew was simply a cipher onto which the anti-Semite could project whatever it was that they considered to be the ultimate evil. In today's online world, the Jew has been replaced by Israel. Israel is now the canvas onto which people project their version of evil, racist, colonialist, white supremacist, however far removed those descriptions are from reality. You see, the old anti-Semitism had very little to do with what Jews really are. And the new anti-Semitism has very little to do with what Israel really is. But 
as long as the explicit target of hatred is Israel or Zionists rather than Jews, then on social media, it gets a free pass. In fact, better than a free pass, it gets a celebrity endorsement. Today's online anti-Semitism gets spread by people who would claim that they don't have an anti-Semitic bone in their body, right? People like, for example, Bella Hadid. Bella Hadid is a successful, smart woman. She's a fierce pro-Palestinian activist with millions of followers across social media. So when Bella Hadid posts herself chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, it has an impact. She is, in effect, to an audience of tens of millions calling for the destruction of the world's only Jewish state. But nobody is going to cancel Bella Hadid. No social media platform is going to suspend her. Israel is consistently attacked as the ultimate evil. And it is not just easy to recognize Nazis and Jack Boots saying so. It's beautiful, kind-hearted celebrities in designer clothing. Vilifying Israel makes you one of the good guys. So never mind if it includes old age anti-Semitic tropes. Never mind if the outcome of your position would be disempowered and dead Jews. But here's the real world impact. In an online space in which Israel is the ultimate evil, then we must suspect all Jews, for they might be evil too. The Jewish student on a college campus who hasn't sufficiently renounced Israel. Jewish diners in the Los Angeles sushi bar on La Cienega Boulevard in LA. Orthodox Jews on the streets of New York. Hatred online needs somewhere to go. And the result are Jewish students silenced as Zionists and Jewish people attacked. Recent research have found that between 73.6 and 84% of online anti-Semitism takes the form of anti-Israel hatred. Accusation that Israel is a bloodthirsty, genocidal state that must be destroyed are not just wrong and misguided. They are the modern day blood libel and we need to fight them accordingly. The numbers are not in our favors. There are less than 15 million Jews in the world. That number is dwarfed by the following of social media influencers demonizing Israel for likes and for shares. Social media platforms need to do the right thing. As Ambassador Lipstadt said, live up to their own standards. I call on them to reevaluate and update their hate speech definition to call denying the Jewish people's right to self-determination what it is. To call portraying Israel as some kind of a mythical evil what it is, and that is modern anti-Semitism. We need a campaign of education and advocacy so that social media influencers and the platforms that host them understand what it is that they're perpetuating. And you, as parliamentarians, you also have a role to play as well. When debate on Israel flares up, and it's going to flare, you need to hold to account those who cross the line between legitimate criticism of Israel or Israeli policies to anti-Semitic demonization of the world's only Jewish state. Calls to destroy Israel, they're not merely free speech. They are an incitement to violence against Jews worldwide. Let us call it what it is, modern anti-Semitism, 21st century blood libel, and today, let us commit to doing everything we can to fight it. Thank you. Thank you, Special Envoy Tishby. We'll now proceed to the five-minute questioning round. Members, please be mindful of the time remaining and allow our witnesses time to answer within your five-minute turn, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. I'll be asking uh, Ambassador Lis Lipstadt uh, a, a series of questions, and my colleagues will each uh, take a turn to ask the other envoys. Ambassador Lipstadt, obviously, thank you so much for giving us your time today for this important topic. Your role is really critical at a critical time in the fight against anti-Semitism. I want to start by asking you about the White House United We Stand Summit, which I had the privilege of attending, attending uh, the President's remarks for. Can you share with us how the priorities of the summit, including combating hate and extremist-fueled violence, 
relate to our task force's work in combating online anti-Semitism? Uh, thank you very much, and again, thank you for convening this, and thank you for having me, and most of all, thank you for your support of my office. It's been instrumental and, and very much appreciated by my whole team. Uh, we sat next to each other yesterday in the White House in the uh, East Room and uh, listened to President Biden call out online hatred, quite specifically, and clearly a man who knows the First Amendment but say we must find a way to combat this hatred. And there were many groups represented there, many minority groups, people who had been, uh, whether LGBTQ, whether uh, people of color, uh, Asians, it didn't matter. There, the whole panoply, and, and of course, Jews as well. And they all referenced the online hatred. Many, of course, spoke of uh, Buffalo. So um, I think there's an increased awareness. And if a gathering like this, whatever we accomplish, at the very least, I think it begins to call, uh, begins or strengthens the call to uh, uh, the attention focused on online media. Uh, I'm often asked, you know, when I'm asked about the surge in anti-Semitism, why now? And there are a number of reasons, conspiracy theories, the proliferation of conspiracy theories, the pandemic, but most of all that there is now a delivery system. Uh, online hatred, uh, online platforms uh, equal the largest megaphone one could have. Um, and uh, what we heard yesterday, I think, was the uh, growing American commitment to, to fighting this hatred. Thank you. Some platforms have decided to allow the worst propagator of state-sponsored anti-Semitism in the world, Iran's supreme leader, to spew his hateful anti-Semitic rhetoric on a grand scale in multiple languages. And I think many of us have seen just exactly what I'm talking about. As we're all aware, Iran's supreme leader constantly calls for the destruction of Israel, supports terrorist networks in Iran and around the world, and spews a deluge of hateful speech against the Jewish people on dozens of Twitter accounts in multiple languages. Ambassador, can you share with us the danger that these horrifying and deceitful messages have on the proliferation of anti-Semitism in general and the larger spread of anti-Semitism online? Um, yes. Um, the Supreme Leader Khamenei has, has a long track record of making absolutely unequivocally hateful uh, statements. Sometimes he, got, he, he, he disguises them as uh, Special Envoy Tishbe uh, uh, referenced in Israel hatred, but sometimes he just drops that and it's, it's plain old Jew hatred. Um, the State Department has called him out. My office has called him out with the full support of the State Department, um, and uh, things we have said have become uh, have given the force of uh, government policies. He shows a blatant pattern of anti-Semitism, and my question would be: Isn't this against Twitter's own guidelines? Uh, at the least, Twitter should explain why he still has an account. Give us a public rationalization. The onus is on them. Uh, I think one of the important things would, and it, it's not hard, to just scroll through his tweets and pull out virtually all of them, but certainly many amongst them, which, which, fit in, which contradict Twitter's policy. And Ambassador, I want to ask you a more fine-tuned question related to that, since you're touching on their policy. You're an expert in global anti-Semitism. Do, do you agree that Twitter should have a more robust policy that requires it to more consistently remove dangerous content, especially from those who have platforms like the Ayatollah? I would say yes. But again, to reiterate, if you can't get a more robust policy, at the very least, live up to your own stated standards. Don't find all sorts of ways to wiggle around them. Let's start there, and let's see how that works. But at the same time, let's examine and let's push them for a, for a more robust policy, as you aptly put it. And in my uh, final 26 seconds, um, we have several platforms that have pledged to ban content that denies or distorts the Holocaust, and there's been a shocking uptick in Holocaust denial. Why do you think we've seen a strong and sustained intentional proliferation of Holocaust denials on social media, especially during the pandemic? And are you satisfied with the measures that the platforms have taken to address Holocaust denial? To answer your last question, simply no. Um, Holocaust denial, many people fail to recognize Holocaust denial is not a radical form of history. It's simply put, it's anti-Semitism 
dressed up in a somewhat rational, a pseudo rational uh, garb. It's very easy to say, oh, I'm just questioning um, uh, historical facts, but it's essentially anti Semitism. It's claiming Jews have made this up to get sympathy, to get a state, uh, to get billions of dollars from Germany and other countries. And there you have all the anti Semitic tropes Jews conniving, Jews secretly planning, Jews using this to get uh, financial support, et cetera. Um, Holocaust denial is a form of anti Semitism. And just like, as again, as, as uh, Special Envoy Tishby and my colleagues um, who are online also emphasized, uh, sometimes people say, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just criticizing Israel. Uh, deniers will say, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just questioning history. Uh, one of the few successes I've had in this regard uh, is at least now people don't talk about revisionism. They aren't revising anything <laughs> they're denying. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Now I'd like to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Canada to question Special Envoy Cutler. Thank you so much, Representative Wasserman Schultz. Uh, we don't have to, the, our microphones go on automatically in Canada. Um, for, 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 first, I, for those of you who are not Canadians, I just Demonstrating like to say that, Canadian superiority, clearly. No, definitely not, definitely not. Um, I, for those of you who are not Canadian, I'd just like to recognize that M Special Envoy Kotler used to be our Attorney General and Justice Minister amongst his many accomplishments, and he used to represent the House District that I have the honor of representing today. Uh, so it's an honor to follow in his footsteps. Representative Kotler, I have a couple of questions for you that I'd really like a very short answer to, and then I'm gonna give you one where you can expand. Is Zionism today used as a euphemism for Jew on social media? The short answer and the testimony that you've heard is yes. And when you have uh, death to Zionists, uh, given the fact that most Jews are themselves as Zionists, then you're speaking about death to Jews. Thank you. And I'd like to read for you a tweet uh, from June the 8th, uh, 2022, that is online right now. Today's Zionism is an obvious plague for the world of Islam. The Zionists have always been a plague, even before establishing the fraudulent Zionist regime. Even then, Zionist capitalists were a plague for the entire world. Now they're a plague, especially for the world of Islam. The lovely gentleman who tweeted this is the Ayatollah Khamenei, and it's right up on Twitter right now, not been taken down despite multitude of reports of this tweet. Professor Kotler, would you say this tweet was anti-Semitic? Anti-Semitic and, and worse, the often forgotten, if in fact it was known, that the uh, 21st century began on January 3rd, 2000 with the uh, Supreme uh, leader Khamenei saying that there can be no resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict without the annihilation of the Jewish state. He didn't even speak about the euphemism of the Zionist regime. That and the many other references to Israel and Zionist cancerous tumors and the like are standing incitements to genocide, breaches of the Genocide Convention as Supreme Court judgments in Canada held the very incitement to genocide constitutes a violation of the convention, whether or not acts of genocide follow. And state parties to the genocide convention, which include the United States, Canada, etc., have a duty to prevent and protect against this incitement to genocide. This is not just a policy option. It is a international legal responsibility and a domestic responsibility for each of the state parties. Thank you so much. And, and now I'm going to give you a question that you can expand on. In, in 2019, myself and my colleague, uh, former MP Michael Levitt, were very much involved in Canada's adoption of the IRA definition as part of our anti-racism strategy. And I know that you were a very strong advocate for that. And you've been one of the world's leading advocates for the IRA definition to be adopted by government, by platforms. Uh, there's two questions I have about that. One of the challenges is it's wonderful we've adopted it. What are the challenges of implementation of the IRA definition. And number two, equally importantly, can you talk about the misconceptions about the IRA definition that people have? Because a lot of people believe you can't criticize Israel under the IRA definition, which is explicitly contradicted by the definition itself. So could you please explain to everyone why IRA is a definition that should be used? I'm pleased to do so. Uh, the IRA non-binding working definition 
on anti-Semitism is the most comprehensive, authoritative, and international consensus definition we have. And what is not always appreciated, it's the most democratic and representative definition that we have because it was adopted over a 20 year period of, by intergovernmental bodies, governments, parliaments, uh, scholars, civil society, leaders, and the like. Number two, it reflects and represents the lived experience of the targets of anti-Semitism themselves, uh, namely the Jews. Number three, it's anchored in human rights principles in general and equality rights in particular. In other words, traditional anti-Semitism is a discrimination against denial of assault upon the rights of Jews to live as equal members in whatever society they inhabit. The new anti-Semitism is a discrimination against denial of assault upon the right of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations, in fact, even of the right uh, to live. What is common to both forms of anti-Semitism, traditional and new, is discrimination. All that has happened is a move from discrimination against the Jews as individuals to the discrimination against Jews as a people, reverberating back against uh, Jews as individuals. And the IRA working definition incorporates both the traditional and contemporary understandings of anti-Semitism. It's also anchored in our international treaty obligations, our international legal obligations uh, to prevent and prohibit uh, incitement to hostility, uh, violence, and discrimination. It also does not, as it is sometimes held, to silent speech. It clearly states that criticism of Israel, like any other state, is not anti-Semitic. But it does go on to say, and here, if I may quote from a unanimous resolution adopted by the Canadian Parliament in February 2015, which said that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic and saying so is wrong, but singling Israel out for selective opprobrium and indictment, denying Israel's right to exist, let alone calling for its destruction, is hateful and discriminatory and anti-Semitic, and not saying so is dishonest. And that was unanimously adopted by all members of uh, parties from all members of parties from all parties in that resolution. Indeed, I would say the, there are important parliamentary protocols, the London Declaration to Combat Anti-Semitism, the Ottawa Protocol to Combat Anti-Semitism, which need to be invoked in this regard, and they frame, they have the very language in their protocols that preceded the actual adoption of the uh, IRA working definition on anti-Semitism. And finally, I would say that what it has to be seen as well is not so much that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic, but that the fact that the IRA working definition does not silence speech, it actually protects speech. It protects the speech, for example, of uh, Jewish students and their supporters on campus who may be marginalized or excluded or stigmatized uh, because of their Jewish identity or because they're uh, a support of Israel. So it's actually protecting speech and not silencing speech. Thank you so much. The gentleman yields back. Thank you, Mr. House Father. Now I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from South Africa, Ms. Madeline Hicklin, for five minutes, who will direct her question to Commissioner Lautenberg. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Lautenberg, I have two questions for you. Commissioner, much of the available data and research online on online anti-Semitism has been focused on Europe and North America. As my colleague, uh, member Hausfather, has mentioned, America saw a 35% increase in anti-Semitic anti attacks and incidents from 2020 and 2021. We have seen the data that demonstrates the correlations in so many regions among anti-Semitic content online and current events, including the COVID pandemic and recent conflict with Hamas. We know that anti-Semitism is a critical issue in your region, and we'd like to better understand the issues in your region and to understand the state of anti-Semitism in Latin America, particularly as the region has recently seen a transition in government from the right to the left of the political spectrum. Can you please describe the most prevalent themes and the scope of anti-Semitism, particularly online anti-Semitism in Latin America today? That's the first question. I'll ask, I'll ask the second one once you have answered, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, Anurag uh, Hickling. It's a pleasure to, to answer, try to answer to your question. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we have it either from the extreme right, either from the extreme left, and it's not different online. Uh, I'd like to stress the data that I received from the ADL, from the AJC, from the Latin American Jewish Congress, and from DIA, which is the Jewish uh, umbrella organization in Argentina who are dedicated to raise the data about anti-Semitism online. And they track the two more important issues as it has happened in other countries, either to the conflict in May, 2021 between Israel and Hamas and almost uh, doubled the content of uh, anti-Semitic online posts during the days of this conflict. Uh, in Twitter, they saw that about 9% about the total content were anti-Semitic posts and kind of 20% of its posts mostly related to anti-Zionist posts. Uh, in Facebook, you see two main uh, arguments. The first of all is the demonization of Israel, even out of the conflict. This is the main uh, trend. Second, and anti-Semitic content related to conspiracies related to the new world order, which is a temporary version of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Is on the side of this traditional anti-Semitism in Latin America uh, that goes along with the distortion of the Holocaust. There is a lot of uh, content based what they called holo story or in Spanish holo cuento uh, about that the things didn't happen exactly like that. Maybe the Jews were not the only victims. Maybe the numbers are exaggerated. So if denial is not something uh, that can be socially accepted anymore, distortion takes it, its place and it's very well uh, spread out. Uh, I would uh, stress countries such as Chile, Uruguay, Panama, and Argentina as the main uh, countries uh, where this uh, kind of distortion and kind of prejudice spread. Uh, if we have to make a mention to one of the providers, we can see that in YouTube, we have seen a decrease uh, of the anti-Semitic posts, which we attribute to a more strict uh, policy of the provider uh, compared to other ones. And we also see that uh, phenomenon that as the social networks uh, try to have a more uh, strict policy or moderate the content or remove or reduce uh, this anti-Semitic posts tend to migrate to other non uh, self-regulated or regulated uh, social networks such as Truth or Gabber uh, or Telegram. Uh, regarding Telegram, I would like to mention uh, uh, not related to anti-Semitic posts, but very important measure made by our electoral court in Brazil, that Telegram did not respond to its uh, summons to sign a memorandum of understanding regarding fake news and hate speech uh, in the elections that we will hold in one month. And after a threat of the court that they would be removed from, from Brazil, uh, suddenly uh, the network appeared and showed interest in signing a memorandum of understanding. And now they are uh, moderating somehow its content in a way that it didn't happen before. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would say that the uh, equivalence, the so-called equivalence of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with the Holocaust is a uh, constant trend in Latin America in calling uh, Israel a Nazi country and trying to say that uh, Israel treats the Palestinians like the Nazi treated the Jews. And this is something that, especially during the conflict, for instance, in Twitter, it doubled the, the number of posts, it passed from eight, 89% to 
19, 27%. So if you trace it to the uh, historic profile that I tried to explain during my first remarks, uh, you have the picture of our situation in Latin America. Thank you, sir. You covered my second question in your response. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Michal kotler wanch to question Special Envoy Noah Tishby. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, I, I just want to begin before I um, ask uh, uh, Special Envoy Tishby with a request and uh, really to implore the Special Envoys that they mirror this interparliamentary um, um, uh, task force to combat online anti-Semitism and work though you are each limited to your geographies and constituencies, and that's obvious in very many realms, to creating together um, a, a cohort of the special envoys to address this growing challenge. Because as we've heard here and have, as we've seen here, and with your significance, experience, expertise, knowledge, and abilities, I think that the special envoys have an incredibly important role in working together with regards to the online, online anti-Semitism, including what we've heard um, in what was what has become obvious with regards to Holocaust denial, being just that, denial, to the denial of the right of the State of Israel, um, ex being exactly that, the denial of the State of Israel to exist in any um, 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 formulation. And that is precisely the mutation of anti-Semitism that brings me to the first question to Special Envoy um, Noah Tishby. And we've heard the background of the IRA and the importance of it being um, the result of an extensive democratic process um, and the only one that actually, at the moment, comprehensively, um, uh, con comprehensively, excuse me, identifies and combats anti-Semitism and its current permeations. Why do you think, Special Envoy, it is that the digital platforms um, are not willing to adopt the IRA, considering that it's been adopted by hundreds of entities, including the majority of our countries, certainly over 35 countries, cities, sports leagues, corporations around the world? That's a great question. So uh, it's not so much what I think, it's what I know. And it's not just social media companies, it's other companies as well. The reason that IRA unfortunately gets a pushback is exactly because of what I was talking about, is exactly because of Israel. Because it has a line there that defines anti-Semitism as denying the Jewish people's right to exist. Um, we've heard in our work that a lot of companies are on the fence about that. And the sad part about it is that by denying only one people's the right for self-determination, first of all, that's racism. There's no other way to look at that, right? And by, by actually agreeing to participate in that and kind of being on the fence about this, they're not treating anti-Semitism equally. So they're saying, yeah, okay, we're all, it's very convenient to condemn Nazis, right? Nobody likes to walk around and call themselves anti an anti-Semite. But you kind of go, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just an anti-Zionist. That is considered okay. And that is one of those things that we have to make clear. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, period, end of story. There's no question about that. So I encourage not just the parliamentarians and not just the social media companies, actually the public, to acknowledge that what they are doing and the shares, when they press share, when they press share on a, on a post that calls Israel a settler colonialist state that shouldn't exist, that's anti-Semitism. That's denying the indigenuity of, of Jews in the land of Israel, right? So this is one of the things that I think that we need to make very clear, that the IRA definition is a perfect working definition. It's obviously non-binding. It's a perfect working definition to explain to people what anti-Semitism is. You know, one of the things that we see online is that it's a lot of people that they don't know they're anti-Semitic. They don't know that they're perpetuating anti-Semitism. They think they love Jews. They think everything is fine. And it's one of those things where as a Jew, you know it when you see it, right? We know it when we see it. It's absolutely anti-Semitism. Um, I have uh, a lot of lived experience in that world. I started, as I said, I started my activism online. I've been harassed. I got my first death threat in 2008 um, because, of, as, because of Israel. Not because of Nazis, because I'm Israeli. And I wasn't even that vocal about Israel at the I was just an Israeli. So we call it surfing the web while Jewish, as, as the activist, right? Or as um, Eve Barlow, activist Eve Barlow called it uh, social media pogrom, right? That's what happens online. This is what we experience. I post Shabbat Shalom, and I get back free Palestine, Palestine you be, <laughs> right? All the time. 
This is the lived experience of Jews online. This is what's happening. And it's not just social media that need to recognize it. Actually, the public should recognize that too. So I think, first of all, you've made a very, very important point in terms of the point of this is actually education of the public. Yes. And the ability to be able to click out and refer to the IRA and understand that you're engaging. And actually, when we held the hearings in Knesset, we also engaged with the understanding that those that are engaged in even Holocaust denial don't necessarily know what the Holocaust was. They certainly don't mean to be engaging <laughs> in Holocaust The most denial. amount of, uh, right. of uh, anti-Semitism exists in places there are no Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people never met a Jew, but they're like, oh, That's these right. Jews are mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> fill in the blank. So I just want to I want to I want to continue sort of this line of of of, of discussion and and think about both about the importance of the top down sort of understanding that the adoption of IRA is actually critical because without it you're actually not identifying or combating anti-Semitism you're maybe identifying combating some ancient form of anti-Semitism yeah. which is possibly a low-hanging fruit at this point, because as you said, nobody wants to be known as a Nazi. But, um, and, and, and there is another element um, um, of, of identifying Zionists as an identity, which we've, you've referred to as actually an integral part of identity having nothing to do with politics. And I think that that's important. And I wonder what you think about um, uh, you know, people who say that the IRA actually excludes the ability to silence or is silencing or includes the ability to criticize the oh. state of Israel <laughs> with regards to that. That's, again, absolutely not true. First of all, criticism of Israel is perfectly, perfectly legitimate. Israelis do it better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that for a fact. Um, this is not what it's about. It's okay to criticize Israeli policies. There's no problem about that. But we're talking about online, right? Israel is the only country in the world that has its own Wikipedia entry, the legitimacy of the state of Israel. North Korea doesn't have that. No other country in the world has that. Israel is the only country that has that definition. So when we talk about denying the Jewish people right for self-determination in their ancestral land, we don't refer to other countries. Because social media companies and other companies would say, it's OK if I, wanna, if I wanna say Denmark shouldn't exist. And to that I say, yeah, but nobody is saying that. <laughs> They're literally only saying that Israel should not exist. And this is what we need to look at. And this is what the public need to understand when they have this subconscious bias about the Jewish people, right? We all carry around subconscious biases about the other. People carry around subconscious biases about Jews as well. And that subconscious bias is affecting their opinion about Israel. It has to do with feelings, not with facts. And that's what I would hope to um, convey to the public that they snap out of it and go, okay, wait, am I criticizing Israel or am I being obsessive um, disproportionately over one country? So th thank you for that. And just, we have time for one last question. So, yeah. uh, and, and I, uh, I just want to say we, that, we yes. We really the, don't. Oh, we don't. Oh, two minutes no. beyond five minutes. Oh, okay, then we do not have a time for another question. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say that actually the IRA actually specifically stipulates the criticism of Israel, like the criticism of yeah. any other country, is completely legitimate. What is not legitimate is that piece of denial that we've spoken about. Uh, Representative Wasserman Schultz, if I could just jump in in yes, response to uh, um, uh, Representative uh, or, or former M MK uh, Michal Katowicz comment. Uh, about the uh, envoys convening. The first thing I did in mid-June before I even started traveling was convene such a meeting uh, at USUN uh, with the under the auspices, joint auspices of my office and that of Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield and EU Representative Special Envoy uh, Katerina von Schnurbein is convening such a meeting in October. So uh, we we've took your challenge before you <laughs> threw it down the gauntlet. So. <laughs> Done and done. <laughs> Thank you so much to our uh, panel of, uh, of expert witnesses. We appreciate your service so much and look forward to working with you going forward to continue to address this problem. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a short break uh, so that we can change panels, and then we'll resume in about two or three minutes. Mm hmm?
going to ask everybody to take their seats. Thank you so much. Our second panel consists of representatives from four social media platforms. We'll be join, joined this, this morning by Neil Potts, the Vice President Pub, Pub, for Public Policy, Trust, and Safety for Meta, Michelle Austin, the Director of Public Policy for the United States and Canada for Twitter, Kevin Kane, the Manager of Government Affairs and Public Policy for YouTube, and Eric Ebenstein, Director of Public Policy for TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> I will, <laughs> I'd like a TikTok, but... That's not what the company's name is. Okay, I will now recognize each witness for five minutes to give their opening statements. First, I'll recognize Mr. Neil Potts representing Meta. Where is he? There you are. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you Chairwoman. Uh, Chairs Wasserman Schultz and House Father and distinguished members of this task force, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss ways that we can work together to combat online anti Semitism. My name is Neil Potts. I'm the Vice President of Trust and Safety Policy at Meta, and I'm part of the team that develops the rules which we call the Facebook Community Standards for what we allow and do not allow on the platform. We are very grateful to be here to share Meta's work with so many stakeholders from governments and civil society around the world. First, I want to start off by saying Meta's mission is to give people the power to build community and to bring the world closer together. Over 3 billion people come to our platform every month to stay connected with family and friends, build their businesses, and share billions of pictures, stories, and videos about their lives and their beliefs each day. The diversity of expression and experience on our platform highlight much of what is best about Meta. And we firmly believe that technology has the power to do good. We also recognize that bad actors may seek to use our platform in unacceptable ways. And we take our responsibility to stop them seriously. As we give people a voice, we want to ensure that they are not using that voice to hurt others. And that is why we have longstanding policies against terrorism and hate. We employ tens of thousands of people and use industry-leading technology, including advanced artificial intelligence, to enforce these rules. In addition, we regularly publish transparency reports so people can see how we're doing over time and how we compare to other internet platforms. We're proud of the work in this space, but we're always working to improve and share our lessons learned. And as everyone here knows, anti-Semitism has been rising, and Jews are being targeted and attacked in record numbers. This is not only apparent from anecdotal information, but also from hate crimes data. Moreover, we want to know, we know that what manifests offline often appears online, although it may, may not take the same shape. I want to underscore our firm commitment to addressing anti-Semitism on our platforms, and we are doing this in four main ways, which I will highlight now. First, we don't want hateful content on our platform, and we constantly reevaluate and update our policies to address the evolving nature of hate speech attacks. This includes banning Holocaust denial and distortion and content with harmful stereotypes about Jewish people, like the claim that Jews run the world or other major institutions. And we ensure our policies consider new forms of hate speech that appear on our platform, such as banning claims that Jews were the cause or are the cause of COVID-19. And these rules exist alongside and work in concert with other policies that we have within our community standards, such as bullying, harassment, violence, and incitement policies, and that we work to prevent those as well. Additionally, as part of our efforts to prevent and disrupt real-world violence, we do not allow organizations or individuals that proclaim a violent or hateful mission or are engaged in violence to have a presence on our platform. And we back these policies up with strong enforcement. We've invested about $5 billion last year in this space, and we have about 40,000 people working on safety and security alone. Next, we also work to educate our users by connecting them with authoritative information about the Holocaust. So anyone who searches on Facebook for terms to associate with either Holocaust or Holocaust denial will see a message from Facebook encouraging them to connect with credible information about Holocaust off Facebook at aboutholocaust.org, a website with facts about the Holocaust and survival testimonials created by the World Jewish Congress and UNESCO. Third, we partner with organizations worldwide to promote awareness of anti-Semitism, give voice to Holocaust survivors, and encourage Holocaust remembrance and education. For example, just this past International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we supported campaigns like We Remember by the World Jewish Congress, which has touched tens of millions of people globally. We also supported the unique project, Don't Be a Bystander, by the Claims Conference, which shone a light on the non-Jewish heroes of the Holocaust who risked their lives to save Jews. And we are honored to have participated in this past March, March of the Living, in this past year's March of the Living, connecting our online work with partners to real world events that demonstrate our commitment to being at the forefront of combating anti-Semitism. Fourth, 
And as the internet continues to evolve and we are investing in programs and research to determine how to responsibly build augmented and, excuse me, virtual reality, including addressing anti-Semitism and highlighting Holocaust remembrance and education. The Anne Frank experience on Oculus is an early example of how technology can help society remember and share stories in new ways. And looking ahead, we'll have more to share on that soon. I know my time is short, so I just wanted to highlight in all these endeavors, we are working closely with the Jewish community, civil society groups, and governments to understand what is happening on the ground in their communities so that we can better rise to meet those challenges as they evolve. Meta has hosted a partner organization roundtables in North America and in Europe, so it's nice to see many of those organizations here at the task force today for this important summit. And lastly, I really want to highlight this point. To underscore our commitment to addressing issues of concern to the Jewish community, Meta has chosen, chosen to dedicate a specific position focused on working with the Jewish diaspora. My colleague, Jordana Cutler, who's here with me today, sitting behind me, uh, she leads that work um, so that we may better understand issues negative, that are negatively impacting the Jewish community, that we can prioritize addressing those in real time. Again, thank you for having us at this important event, and I do look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Potts. Ms. Austin, representing Twitter, I'll recognize you for five minutes. Thank you very much for the invitation to appear to dis today to discuss combating online anti-Semitism. On behalf of Twitter, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of all committee members and witnesses on this issue. On a personal level, I would also like to acknowledge CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, and CJ PAC, the Canadian Jewish Political Action Committee, for their collaboration as well as their frank and open dialogue on this issue. There are a lot of Canadians in this room doing a lot of great work on this issue, which I would also like to compliment and uh, call out. Twitter's purpose is to serve the public conversation. When individuals create Twitter accounts and begin tweeting, their tweets are immediately viewable and searchable by anyone around the world. It is this open and real-time conversation that differentiates Twitter from other digital companies. We also recognize that if people receive abuse from and harassment on Twitter, it can discourage them from expressing themselves and ultimately diminish the value of a global, public, and inclusive conversation. Anti-Semitic anti abuse has absolutely no place on Twitter. Anti-Semitism falls under our hateful conduct policy. Hateful conduct can take many forms, and our rules are intended to address a wide range of prohibited behaviors and activities that seek to target individuals or groups of people on the basis of their perceived membership in a protected category. The Twitter rules apply to everyone using our service. The rules are there to help keep, keep people safe and to ensure they can participate freely in the public conversation. Our approach, to, our approach to abusive content, in addition to prohibiting the denial of violent events, also covers targeted and non-targeted content. And in line with our glorification of violence policy, we take action against content and behavior that attempts to glorify, praise, or deny acts of violence and genocide, including the Holocaust. We strongly condemn these behaviors and take enforcement action when content breaks our rules. In recent years, we have worked with external experts, including the Anti-Defamation League and other organizations to help bring about our policies in line in this area with international human rights standards. We also work with partners to promote Holocaust Memorial Day and with external Jewish organizations running campaigns to counter anti-Semitism both online and offline. Transparency is also important. In 2012, we were the first social media company to publish a transparency report, and since then it has become an industry standard. Since we first reported data behind our enforcement of the Twitter rules in 2018, we've significantly evolved our approach to how we detect and take down content that is against our rules. As an open platform for free expression, we have always sought to strike a balance between the enforcement of our own rules covering prohibited behaviors and the legitimate leads of not law enforcement with the ability of people to express their views freely on Twitter, including views that some people may disagree with or find offensive. We collaborate and cooperate with law enforcement entities when appropriate and in accordance with legal processes. Around the world, we have regular and timely dialogue with officials across governments working on these domestic issues related to these files. In addition to governments, Twitter partners with global and local non-government organizations to help inform our work to counter online extremist content. As a case in point, 
We have drawn for the work from the work of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, when developing content policy along with enforcement guidelines. I'm happy to answer any questions about our policies, policy enforcement, and product solutions, and the way in which we are working to protect the safety of the conversation on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Austin. Uh, now I'd rec recognize Kevin Kane representing YouTube for five minutes. Distinguished members of the Interparliamentary Task Force, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today for this important discussion. My name is Kevin Kane, and I'm a member of YouTube's public policy team that advises the company on policy matters related to online user-generated content. YouTube's mission is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. Openness has always been one of YouTube's guiding principles, and freedom of expression is a big part of what makes YouTube special. But freedom of expression does not mean anything goes, and we've always had rules of the road about what is allowable on YouTube and what is not, including our long-standing policies against anti-Semitic content and other forms of hate speech. Responsibility is our number one priority at YouTube and is central to every product and policy decision we make. There is no place on YouTube for hateful content. Not only is this type of content harmful to our community, but the overwhelming majority of creators, viewers, and advertisers don't want to be associated with it, meaning it's also bad for business. Our approach involves four pillars of responsibility, which we refer to as the four R's, that I will now discuss in further detail. Our first pillar is to remove content that violates our policies, which includes our longstanding policy against hate speech. We consider hate speech, we consider content hate speech when it incites hatred or violence against groups based on protected attributes such as gender, race, religion, or sexual orientation. This policy also prohibits content alleging that a group is superior in order to justify discrimination, segregation, or exclusion. This would include, for example, videos that promote or glorify Nazi ideology. We also do not, do not allow content that denies the existence of well-documented violent historical events, such as denying uh, uh, that the Holocaust took place. Machine learning is critical to keeping our users safe. In the second quarter of 2022, of the 4.5 million videos that were removed for violating our community guidelines, 93% of those videos were first flagged by our systems, and two-thirds received fewer than 10 views before they were removed. Our second responsibility pillar is to raise authoritative content. In addition to our policy efforts, our systems connect viewers to credible, authoritative videos from sources like the U.S. National Holocaust Memorial Museum in the U.N. by surfacing this content higher in search results through recommendations. For Holocaust-related searches, we also provide information panels at the top of search results and directly under videos, which provide users additional information from an authoritative source. Our third responsibility pillar is to reduce the spread of borderline content which is content that comes close to but doesn't cross the lines of violating our policies. We use machine learning to reduce the recommendations of this content, which represents just a fraction of what is watched on YouTube. We are able to, to raise authoritative information and reduce borderline content by using classifiers to identify whether a video is authoritative or borderline. These classifications rely on human evaluators who are trained through a set of detailed, publicly available rating guidelines. Our final pillar is to reward trusted creators. Millions of channels from over 90 different countries earn revenue from their videos by participating in our YouTube Partner Pro Program, or YPP. Through YPP, creators earn revenue generated from advertising that is shown to viewers before or during a video. This revenue from ads is shared between YouTube and the creator, with the creator receiving majority share, thus enabling creators, creators to directly profit from their work. YouTube is proud to be an industry leader in supporting the creator community and entrepreneurs who use YouTube each day to build or support their businesses. According to a newly released report from Oxford Economics, YouTube's creative ecosystem contributed more than $25 billion to the U.S. economy and supported the equivalent of 425,000 full-time jobs in 2021. In Canada, YouTube contributed $1.1 billion to the Canadian economy and supported the equivalent of more than 34,000 jobs. Responsibility is and will continue to be our number one priority. Our business depends on it. We have made huge progress making our community safer but we know that our work is not done, nor will it ever be. We are committed to continuing investments in teams, technologies, and product features to make sure YouTube continues to be a place where people come to be informed and inspired. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to recognize Mr. Eric Eppenstein representing TikTok for five minutes. MP House Father, Congressman, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, Ms. Kotler Wunsch, and, and members of the task force. Good morning. My name is Eric Ebenstein. I'm a director of public policy for TikTok, based here in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. We appreciate the opportunity to share how we are protecting our community from anti-Semitic content. Growing up in New Jersey, I was unfortunately subjected to anti-Semitism myself. Keeping this kind of hateful content off of the platform is incredibly important to me and indeed a, a point of personal pride. First, I want to be able to define what TikTok is and, and what we strive to be. TikTok's mission is to inspire creativity and bring joy. We thrive on life's authentic contents, whether it's a 30-second video of family togetherness or the kind of content we see from 98-year-old Holocaust survivor Lily Ebert and her great-grandson Dove. The two of them have nearly 2 million followers and produce content on a regular basis educating their followers and the global community about her experiences and keeping this kind of testimony alive and vibrant is incredibly important and the best of TikTok. In order to achieve our mission of inspiring creativity and bringing joy, we must first ensure the community on our platform is safe. There are three main ways that TikTok protects its user community. Our community guidelines reflect our values and outline the behavior and content we allow. These apply to everyone and everything on the platform. Our pioneering safety policies allow us to enforce our community guidelines. This includes investing in innovative technologies, such as image matching, sensitive word filters, and machine learning classifiers to proactively flag hateful content. Of course, in addition to these automated solutions, we also have human moderators, thousands of them, all around the world, working to manually identify and remove harmful content. Our work with leading safety organizations, like the Anti-Defamation League, the World Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Congress, helps us to better understand and address the priorities and concerns of the communities that they serve. I want to speak next about the role that content moderation plays. In order to effectively moderate our content, we must first define what kind of content is unacceptable on TikTok. We have a zero tolerance stance on organized hate groups and those associated with them, like accounts that spread or are linked to anti-Semitism, white supremacy, and other hate-based ideologies. While hate is not new, the methods by which people try to spread it continue to evolve, which is why our policies must and do evolve alongside them. For instance, some users were going, will try to attempt to use coded language to avoid detection by our filters and moderators. In response, we've hired a team of investigators to identify such evolutions, which we then use to train our detection models and our human moderators. We are making it more difficult for our users to find hateful content on TikTok. For instance, if someone searches for a hateful ideology, they'll be redirected to the community guidelines. In the first quarter of 2022, we removed nine out of 10 pieces of content before it was viewed by any user. But as we all know, education is one of the most powerful ways to counter hate, and TikTok is proud to actively identify new opportunities to educate and prevent the spread of misinformation among our user community. This past year, in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day, we partnered with the World Jewish Congress and UNESCO to provide our global community with easy access to educational resources year-round. More information about TikTok's efforts surrounding Holocaust Remembrance Day are available on, in our newsroom on a blog post that I authored from this January. However, we can't do this important work alone. We are focused on developing relationships and cooperating with governments around the globe to find ways that we can work together to combat anti-Semitism and hate in all of its forms. We're also in regular contact with NGOs and external experts to ensure that we stay ahead of emerging trends to protect our community. We are grateful to work with organizations such as the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs in Canada. Most recently, we joined Tech Against Terrorism, an initiative launched and supported by the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, which brings together technology companies, civil society, and academics over our shared goal of eradicating terrorist content online. Again, we know that the important work of countering violent extremism fostering safe online spaces and promoting human dignity cannot be done alone. We are extremely proud to partner with external experts like these to ensure that our policies are effective and meaningful. Promoting a safe and secure experience for our community is our top priority, and we very much value being a part of this conversation. We look forward to working with this task force and civil society stakeholders to protect our community from anti-Semitic content. Really appreciate you allowing me to be here today. Look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Evanstein. Thank you all for all of your opening remarks. We'll now proceed to the five-minute question round. I'll again remind members to please be mindful of your time and allow our panel members time to answer uh, their, your question within your five-minute turn. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. I do thank our witnesses for being here. We have some tough questions for you, as I'm sure you're not surprised, but I hope our mutual goal is to find more effective ways to combat anti-Semitism, hate, and violent extremism. I would admonish the witnesses to please keep your answers 
tight to allow for us to be able to fully ask the questions we've prepared for you. And I will just caution you that the members are prepared to interject, interject if your answers run too long. Okay. Um, Mr. Potts, I'll start with you. Um, last year, the ADL found that Meta's response time, let me just get the report out here. Last year, ADL found that Meta's response time in this report that I'm, I'm holding here to combat anti-Semitic content generally took between 24 and to 72 hours. Briefly, why does it take you that long? Uh, thank you for that uh, question, uh, Congresswoman. I guess I, I would first start off by saying that we do a majority of our identification and now removal proactively through our automated systems, uh, so much so that we, I think, identify over 95%, maybe to closer to 97% of hate speech and violent activity on the platform before it's ever user reported, and then we go ahead and, and remove that. There are some cases where the um, our agreement, uh, we would try to strive for 24 hours. There are some cases that may cause need more context that we are able to uh, provide that for us to make a decision on a particular piece of content. I would have to go back through to, to make sure that that sample uh, addresses or maybe fits with the the majority of the work that we do in this space. But we do, okay. we are very transparent on that and you can okay. find that at our CSER. What your, your, your response is unfortunately not aligning with what ADL found. I mean, 90, this is why transparency is important. I'm not sure that anyone would believe that Meta removes 90% of the content that is attempted to be posted before anyone sees it. Um, and, you know, to the degree that you're suggesting you remove quickly, we all support that. But I'm asking about the times, much more often than not, that you move too slowly. What causes those delays? Sometimes, he's, he, as you know, um, Congresswoman, uh, speech itself is something very hard to to uh, address through regulation or through possibly through rules. As we think about this, we do have very clear rules around hate speech. Very what causes, forgive me, what causes the delays in taking down speech that violates your policies? It can be, we, we must first identify it. And so there, that will obviously be a possible delay. We are not removing content before it's posted. We have to make a decision on that content. And the content that is does require additional context may require additional, essentially, participants' eyes on to make okay. those decisions. OK, here's what, I, here's what I want. I'd like you to provide us with the following three things. One, a detailed breakdown showing the range of your response times over the past year for addressing anti-Semitic content on your platforms. Two, your internal policies for when and how you address anti-Semitic content. And three, the specific steps you've taken to decrease response times. Can you provide us with that information? I'll have to come back to you for those specifics. You can find majority of that information already. We make available through our community standards enforcement report. No, no, I'm not talking about it. It isn't evident in your community standards. I'm talking about the, the, the more granular specifics that would respond, that would be responsive to those questions. For, for response. I don't want to just be pointed to your community standards no, I, policy. I, I'm, not, I'm not pointing you to the policies, ma'am. I'm trying to point you to our transparency report that talks about how we enforce those policies. But it's a fair, it's a fair question. I don't know if response times are included within that, we will come back to you. Okay. Social media platforms have to be held accountable for their algorithmic amplification of harmful, radicalizing content that leads to offline violence. But Facebook is not changing the design of a social network that's built to amplify extremism. If you aren't changing algor algorithms built to exploit the primal human emotions like fear, anger, and anxiety that keeps users glued to their screens, how can you effectively make progress towards your stated goal of removing hate speech and anti-Semitism from your platforms? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. That does give me an opportunity to, uh, to address this. I think there is an, a bit of a myth that we somehow benefit from driving people towards extremism. That couldn't be more against what we try to do. We believe in a safe platform because we believe a safe platform encourages people to continue to come back and engage. Um, we do not blindly drive people towards the extremes, and maybe even more so, we work hard to reduce problematic content. We remove content that violates our policies. We reduce a lot of content, especially content that may be problematic okay. but not violating I'm asking policies. you to specifically answer a question about your algorithms and how they propagate hate speech instead of actually slowing it down and stopping it. And what I'm concerned about is that Meta's algorithm still profits from helping the worst anti-Semitic and white supremacist groups. Facebook claimed a year ago it had taken steps to rid its sites of hate groups. 
Yet the Tech, Not Tech Transparency Project in August found over 80 white supremacist groups with a presence on your site, with some even on Facebook's lists of dangerous organizations. And worse, when users search for these groups, results are often monetized with ads, meaning Facebook profits from helping haters meet up or recruit. And I'm just going to have to move on because I have a very tight time frame, but I would like the information that I've asked you for to be brought to us for the record so that we can really get a good look into your policies. And, and lastly, uh, Ms. Austin, of the four companies represented today, Twitter was one of the last companies that did not have a policy squarely prohibiting Holocaust denial. Has Twitter changed its policy on this, and can you explain why? And if not, will you commit to developing a policy against content denying the Holocaust? Fair criticism. Uh, our uh, anti-Semitism falls under our hateful conduct policy. Uh, we have been working with the IHRA. We are happy to work with you to continue to evolve that policy. So the answer is no. You have not adopted a policy that prohibits Holocaust denial from from being posted on Twitter. Anti-Semitism falls under the hateful conduct policy. Which you know, I'm asking the have you adopted a policy that prohibits Holocaust denial from being posted on your site? Not anti-Semitism, specifically Holocaust denial. Yes, you have. We have, we have action Holocaust denial tweets consistently. It falls under our um, policy with regard to violent events. Will you commit to developing a much more specific, consistent policy to take down content that denies the Holocaust? I will certainly take that back, yes. Okay, well, we look forward to hearing back from you. Okay, my time has expired, and now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Canada, Mr. Anthony House, Father, for his questions. Thank recognized you. for five minutes. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. We don't have subpoena power. You all came of your own volition, and that is very appreciated. And also, having gotten to know each of the people in this room, I know that you all are people of good faith who want to tackle anti-Semitism. So let me just ask you a couple of brief questions that I hope I can get a yes or no on from each of you. Is the amount of anti-Semitic content on your platform of deep concern to your company? Uh, Kevin? Uh, certainly, any anti-Semitic content would be uh, in violation of our hate speech policies, and that's the type of content that we want to remove as quickly as possible. Uh, Mr. Potts? Similarly, any, any type of that speech we want to remove as quickly as possible. Mr. Ebersol? We have a zero tolerance stance towards this kind of content. We remove nine out of ten examples of it before it's ever viewed, and we want, we want, we're not going to rest until we get as close to ten out of ten as possible. Ms. Austin? Yes. Thank you. That was the word I, the word I was looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Do you believe that it is important that the public at large have faith in your efforts to tackle anti-Semitism? Just yes or no? Yes. 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 Excellent. So then let me come to a question that my colleague asked before. We were talking about anti-Semitism. She asked, made us specific questions about how it tackles anti-Semitism. And uh, you referred, Mr. Potts, to your transparency report, and I've read all of your transparency reports, but none of your transparency reports in any way categorizes anti-Semitism. There, there, there's absolutely no way for anybody to know the prevalence of anti-Semitism on any of your platforms because none of your transparency reports breaks down the categories of hate. So there's no way for her to have had any of the answers that she asked for because it, it doesn't say how, how quickly anti-Semitism is reported or actually, in fact, how anything is reported. Um, so let me ask a question. In most fields, there are independent audits that reassure the public of what you are saying. And there's consistent transparency across the industry because you're required by law to have one standard statement um, that is audited. Would you be willing, given the lack of data that is out there, and, and I'll point to you ADL's uh, data accessibility report that gave Twitter a B, that gave... Um, uh, YouTube a C, that gave Meta a D, and that gave TikTok an F, um, would you be willing to work with this committee to share data, and we will do this properly, respecting the privacy of all of your users, we will work with outside experts, and we will do an independent evaluation, but with access to all of the data that organizations like ADL are missing when they do their reports. For example, you, um, Mr. Potts, have frequently have mentioned, and I agree with you, that there's a lot that Meta does that we do not see, right? It's not just how quickly you take down hate speech to tackle anti-Semitism. There are other things that you do. But in order to make a holistic evaluation, the person who's looking at that actually needs to know all of the things that each of you do, which nobody really does. So 
I'm hoping to get, well, at least we'll take that back and we'll get back to you. Um, would you take that back and get back to us from Meta to work with us, to work with some independent experts that we engage to do a, an, an audit on, on how Meta deals with anti-Semitism? Uh, thank you, Mr. Charles Father. Uh, we do seek to be transparent, as we mentioned, about our CSER, our algorithms, and bright tools. I'm happy to take it back uh, to uh, investigate this more, and we'll come back to you. Thank you. Ms. Austin? I'm going to give a little more lengthy answer because I think it's important. You have access to that through our application program interface, and I think it's important for the uh, NGOs in the room to know that they can apply to have access to our full database through our research application program interface, and they should do that, and that information is publicly available, which is why you get so many research reports on Twitter versus other platforms. Agreed, but just to, to note that that doesn't give us all of the different information on how Twitter is tackling anti-Semitism on the platform. For example, I refer to the tweet of Ayatollah Khamenei that is clearly an anti-Semitic tweet that is still up on the platform. Uh, Mr. Ebersol? I mean, I'd like to start by saying, yes, of course, we'll bring that back and discuss it, but I'd like to do, do, do us one better by referring to a blog post from earlier this summer where, we, where we, we announced opening of our API to selected researchers, and that's something that I would encourage some of the organizations in this room to apply for. And also, as we discussed, I believe, yesterday, an invitation to our transparency and accountability centers, which are opening in Los Angeles and elsewhere, where you'll be able to do model content moderation sessions and have API access under uh, specific inv invitations. Thanks so much, Mr. Kane. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, in July of this year, we launched a new research initiative. So university researchers from around the world can gain access to YouTube's APIs to study any number of, uh, of issues. And we look forward to continuing to work with those researchers and ensure that they uh, have access to, to those systems while at the same time safeguarding user privacy. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Housefather. Now I'd like to recognize Ms. Kotler Wanch from Israel for her five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, <clears throat> I'd actually like to start with Twitter um, and say that just over two years ago, I had an exchange in Israel's 23rd Knesset with Twitter, uh, actually uh, making very, very clear that while the President of the United States uh, account at the time was removed, the calls uh, of the uh, Supreme Leader of Iran for genocide and destruction of the State of Israel remain online. They remain online today. My a uh, fellow uh, task force member uh, mentioned some of the tweets that are still there today. I want you to know if, you know if there's been any change and what would be your you know, sort of explanation for those inconsistencies in application of policy. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, what you are referring to is our world leaders policy and we, I was very um, happy to hear a number of the comments from the envoys and the ambassadors with regard to this issue. Um, our policies are often go out for public consultation, and we are willing to work with you. Sorry, with I don't want to disturb to you, but at the time, what I was told was that what the Supreme Court leader's um, uh, tweet was actually considered saber rattling, according to your um, policy. So I'm not sure if that's helpful at all, if it's considered saber rattling. And I'm wondering if there's any, anything being done to actually, you know, sort of address that inconsistency in application of those policies. Is it still considered saber rattling to call for genocide? Noted. I have no comment on the individual content of that tweet, uh, but with regard to the policy, we have updated our hateful conduct policy, I think, twice since you had that hearing, uh, with, uh, with um, collaboration with the IHRA uh, and a number of external organizations. Uh, we're happy to work with you to uh, clarify those kinds of issues. So, so if you mentioned the IRA, uh, IHRA, the IRA before as well, and I'm wondering, do you have a reference to IHRA when people are engaging in anti-Semitism, or how do you use IHRA? Because what's gone sort of across the board is that we're constantly reacting. It's this whack-a-mole removal of content, and we have, you know, incredible, I'm sure, um, work that's been done to be able to ensure that um, there is anti-Semitic content removed, and you all attested to that. But what definition are you using to remove that content? Thank you for the question and appreciate it. Yes, this is, um, everyone is certainly trying to game the system and as uh, noted earlier, they use language in order to do that. So um, we consult and we are very open with the consultation, including with IRA. We have a Trust and Safety Council, which includes a number of organizations um, and we will come to you as our policies development to ask for collaboration and for input. So I actually, I just want to uh, sort of reference the interim report that we issued in 2021, and I want to say there is a real world definition that defines anti-Semitism. It's the result of a 20-year democratic process, as we've heard here, and it is not only um, a, a sort of uh, uh, addressing the issue of Holocaust denial, which is a serious issue, of course, but so is the state of Israel's denial a serious issue. So we can't just address anti-Semitism and relate to the dead Jews, 
of the Holocaust, we have to relate to the live Jews that are actually experiencing real world harm because we don't have a definition for anti-Semitism on the platform. So the fact that offline there is a definition and countries and cities and sports leagues have adopted this definition is actually almost rendered meaningless by the fact that the digital online space doesn't utilize the same definition. I implore all of you, and I know that you won't be able to give me an answer here, to please come up with a response to our recommendation as a task force to adopt the IRA, just as hundreds of entities across the world have, because it is the only way to comprehensively address what we see as rising anti-Semitism around the world with real world effects. And I did want to ask um, Meta's representative, if I still have time, I do. Yeah. What are the um, um, possibilities or um, lack thereof, and we've heard from all of the platforms that there are um, uh, uh, protected attributes and hate context and community standards. What is um, uh, the possibility of including Zionist as an identity, as a protected characteristic in your, and I hope in other um, um, platforms, protected characteristics? Because, and I just want to repeat this, Zionist is an integral part of the identity of the majority of Jews and many non-Jews who self-define as Zionists and um, not enabling the same protection from harm, from real world harassment and intimidation to anybody that self-defines as a Zionist actually creates a huge disparity between protected identities and categories as there should be on your platforms and in the others and between those that self-define as Zionists. Thank you, Ms. Cutler-Walsh for, the, um, for the, the question. Our policies can take into a number of considerations, including the use of uh, different terms and proxies brought possibly to attack people based on their protected characteristics, that are, which are informed through uh, consultation. Um, and we understand that there are occasions where the criticism of Zionists will, uh, is also used to attack people based off of their ethnicity, based off of their religion. And so when we hear those attacks based off of being Jewish or being Israelis, those are not allowed. But we also notice that there are nuances to that. Um, when people call for the boycott or criticize entities and governments, we do want to make sure that we have space for that speech. So, here, so hearing, hearing your, your, your comments, and especially those that are discussing identity, that's something that we will take back and we'll consult with our experts as well to make sure that we are in the right place as we draw the line. I appreciate that. And I think I'm out of time. I had one last question for you too. But... Thank you, Ms. cutler -Wanch. Next, I'll yield to the gentleman from Canada, Mr. Michael Levitt, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, I greatly appreciate all the efforts that's gone in today's hearing. Let me get straight into questions, because our, uh, our time is obviously tight. Um, Ms. Austin, I'm going to uh, have a few questions for you. Uh, you joined us here from Ottawa, Canada, so um, I, first question is just roughly how many Twitter accounts exist? Roughly. 200 million, I will get back to you on okay. that account. Is that with or without the bots? <laughs> okay, we, that, that's okay, we can roll on from there. Um, I want to focus on two. Uh, one a Canadian one, and one international, both hatefully anti-Semitic in terms of their content. Miss Austin, having joined us from Ottawa, you will be familiar with the name Laith Marouf, yes? His tweets became the subject of national headlines over the last month and I presume they've caused some reflection probably within the halls of Twitter, certainly within your offices locally in Ottawa. Correct. So I wanna, I've got a sample of, uh, I'll sh share one tweet here. I have a motto, life's too short for, shoelace, for shoes with laces or for entertaining Jewish white supremacists with anything but a bullet to a head, to the head. That was uh, a tweet from an account that uh, was suspended in uh, July of last year. You're familiar with that account? I am. Okay. Um, it came after numerous complaints. The, one of the individuals who was uh, the force behind this information coming to the public's knowledge was a gentleman, a media consultant named Mark Goldberg. And Mark Go Goldberg has said that he had 90% um, of his complaints about tweets on uh, going through that account were actually rejected, but I will say, um, obviously, at some point, uh, the, uh, the account was suspended. You'd be familiar with the terms of the suspension of that account, yes? No, I, we wouldn't so, comment so, on the individual account. So let me read you the language um, at the foot of that suspension. Note that if you attempt to evade permanent suspension by creating new accounts, we will suspend your accounts. If you wish to appeal the suspension, please contact our support team. 
was that account, was there, uh, was there an appeal on the suspension of that account? We would not comment on that. Okay. Um, but there's a new account. A new account was opened. And do you want to know how the individual evaded the uh, complex safeguards in place at Twitter? I have a feeling you're going to tell me. I, I am. He used an underscore. His previous account had been at Laith Maroof. His new account is at Laith underscore Maroof. Does that sound like it meets the safeguards and, and the terms of the suspension? Because the original account is s still suspended, which suggests to me either it was not appealed or the appeal was rejected. But let's go for a moment and look at some of the tweets that exist in that account. So as an example, um, you know, and this is, again, this is from July of, uh, sorry, August of this year. You know all those loudmouth bags of human feces, AKA the Jewish white supremacists? When we liberate Palestine and they have to go back to where they came from, they will turn to being low-voiced bitches of their Christian slash secular white supremacist masters. Now, we don't know what else is going on in that account. I want to just go to a comment that you made at the start of your testimony. You said, and I quote, one of the advantages of your platform is their tweets are immediately viewable and searchable. But are this individual's tweets viewable and searchable in this account that he's put up, which seems to be based on, on the reading of his suspension letter, which he posted, by the way, seems to have not been allowed to go up in the first place. But do you know why we can't know whether his tweets are immediately viewable and searchable? I do. Why is that? Because we have given users multiple choices on how they use the product. Right, so he's chosen, he's chosen, to, he's chosen to restrict access. So an individual who, it seems, should not be up with another account, now has the ability to preach to his followers. But, you know, Twitter likes to go out and approach some of the organizations around the table today um, asking us to please keep you informed, be mindful when we see hate online, but we can't do it when accounts go up restricted. So, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, with all of this going on, how you feel we can be allies, whether it's the government, the NGOs, um, the advocates in the room, the special envoys, how can we be protecting when in this situation an individual is allowed to go back online re restricted so that we've got no clue where he's tweeting? Well, first I'd like to uh, thank I, I, Mr. Housefather for his incredible work trying to uh, bring this to light after the Government of Canada funded this individual and his public tweets were part of the reasons why uh, there was a large outcry in that people could see what he was tweeting and then we took him down. There's no doubt we make mistakes. There's no doubt we can do better. So this is a mistake? It's a mistake that the second account is up and it's restricted? As I said, I won't comment on individual accounts. Can we ask you to report back to this committee with whether or not this is a mistake after doing some research? We'd be happy to report back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Next, I'll yield five minutes to the gentleman from New Zealand, Mr. Simon O'Connor, for his questions. Look, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and to acknowledge um, all four of your platforms uh, here today for, for turning up. It's a novelty to a New Zealander because uh, it's a long way to come to uh, New Zealand, easier for me to come to you. So, look, thank you for the work you are doing. Um, but I suppose the, the underlying issue I've certainly seen in my own jurisdiction and even as we've been discussing here today and my uh, good and honourable colleague here, Michael Levitt, and others sharing examples of the problems that are getting through and the perception of what your platforms are doing versus what you say um, presents a gap. Um, and I don't say that in an accusative way, uh, but certainly for a lot of New Zealanders and certainly for myself, uh, what you've been sharing about your filters and platforms, what you are and able to achieve, uh, moderation does not does not reconcile with what we continue uh, to see. Um, I acknowledge with the likes of Twitter the uh, world leaders policy, um, but I might argue when I look at how different world leaders are taught, uh, the Iranian president seems to get um, one hell of a long leash, excuse the New Zealand parlance. Um, <laughs> when I think of the likes of YouTube, um, again, an amazing platform, but the recommendations do seem to take people down uh, whopping big rabbit holes, particularly in the anti um, Semitism area. Uh, Facebook has its own issues. Again, we seem just time and time again, um, time and time again, uh, content which just remains present. 
And I must admit, uh, for various reasons to do with my foreign affairs work, I, I don't have much experience directly with TikTok, so I apologise, sir. How would you uh, respond to New Zealanders and people in general, and again, the examples given here today, between what you are saying and the perception of many, and I would say if I can speak to this direction of the task force, it doesn't reconcile. And if I can, I know I've gone broad, if I could start with Mr Kane and go across to my left, your right, and please, TikTok's welcome to respond as well. Yes, sir, thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, to address this issue, YouTube has focused extensively on improving transparency. Uh, for example, uh, last year we released a metric which was referred to as the violative view rate, which is essentially uh, examines how many views on YouTube come from violative content. And the way that stands uh, today in the second quarter of this year is approximately nine views out of every 10,000 views on YouTube come from violative content. This is a metric that we had been tracking internally for a number of years, but in the interest of, of improving transparency and understanding uh, of our platform, we made that information public. And, and I would note that uh, the metric as it stands today is approximately a 70% reduction uh, over where it was uh, three years ago. We're gonna continue to drive this number down, but additionally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're also partnering with research access to help improve understanding uh, of our platform, and certainly, uh, you know, we want to work with researchers, learn, adapt, and improve uh, to make sure that YouTube uh, uh, is a responsible platform, and there's always more that we can do, and we're committed to doing that work. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, similarly, we believe in transparency as well, and we publish all of our community standards enforcement reports uh, that you can find uh, through our Transparency Center. Um, also, uh, maybe to echo something that Kevin mentioned, uh, we believe in prevalence as a good metric for understanding how much of this violating content you may see. So for example, for us hate speech, you may see about two pieces of violating hate speech content within 10,000 different pieces of content, so it's 0.02%. And so as we talk about things like time and why something may be left online, we are focused on getting the potentially the most viral issues down and then making sure that we are demoting and pushing down until we can make a decision, those other potentially violating pieces of content. Thank you for the question, Mr. O'Connor. I'm, I'm sorry you're not as familiar with TikTok. I, I welcome the opportunity to travel to New Zealand at your convenience and, and meet you with there to give you more of an informative 101 on TikTok. I will say we have taken down nine out of every 10 pieces of violative content in the first quarter of 2022 as disclosed in our community guidelines uh, report and our transparency report. Um, we're not gonna rest until we get that number closer and closer to 10 out of 10. We're a relatively new young platform, but we're continuing to invest money and, and person power into this effort to get better and better until it, everyone is satisfied. And we're gonna continue having conversations as important as this one, meeting with external stakeholders and continuing along as, as best we can. Uh, thank you for the question. And I'll just add briefly that we continue to explore how we can increase transparency for our users and the public in line with the best practices set forth by the Santa Clara Principles on Transparency and Accountability and Content Moderation. And my very last seconds, uh, there's something called the Christchurch Call, which the New Zealand Prime Minister uh, and uh, President Macron uh, set up. You're all part of it, which is fantastic. You're not responsible for this. I want to make this really clear. You are not responsible for this. But are you aware that Israel is not actually part of the Christchurch call? Of all the nations that are, are part of it and included, that Israel's not part of that. Is that something you're aware of? And again, I really want to stress, you are not responsible. This is a political leadership question. Is that something your platforms are aware of? I think we're all deeply involved with that uh, call to action and organizations around it, including GIFCT, and we're more than happy to work with countries that uh, fall outside that. Um, call to action. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now I'd like to turn to my dear friend and colleague from the great state of Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for his five minutes of questions. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, and thanks to uh, all of my fellow parliamentarians here. Thanks for joining us in Washington for uh, this really important hearing, and, and thanks to our witnesses who are here. I, and I apologize I had to run to another meeting um, I apologize if you've discussed some of this. It would be really helpful for me to go through this um, as succinctly as possible. Um, and <clears throat> Eric, I think I'll start with you. You referenced TikTok being a young company. Uh, um, it's true. It also seems like everyone is on TikTok today. It is the most downloaded by young people, certainly. 
uh, and has risen really to the forefront of social media and entertainment. So um, since, you're, since you're a newer company, I would, uh, it would follow that you've obviously had the benefit, a lot of benefit of watching other companies in the social media space, seeing mistakes that may have been made <clears throat> by, uh, by some of these companies, seeing what happened with violent extremism on other platforms, how it was nurtured and proliferated. So um, I guess the first question is, is that accurate? Have you seen that? And did knowing this and seeing what happened to those platforms impact your actions in the early development of TikTok? And, and then if you could just also address how the company's policies continue to change just in the last couple of years in light of the, uh, the new information and new threats, that would be helpful for me. Sure, thank you, Congressman. Um, so we're a relatively new company, as, as you rightly pointed out, but we operate with the expectations of, of all of our peers. We're not using that as any kind of an excuse. So yeah, a, a large portion of our a growing employee populace here in the U.S. has is either come from other companies or seen what other companies have, have done, and we work together to come up with the best policies that we can. Our community guidelines are a vibrant living document by which we moderate the content for the rules of our road, and they change in, in real time. We don't take it lightly. We don't do it all the time because we want our users to understand how they can operate safely and, and fairly on the platform, but we'll, we'll change them in, in, you know, in time. Can I just interrupt first? I'm sorry, what does it mean it's vibrant and living? How does, how does, it, how does it live and grow? Um, our, our, com our community takes itself, you know, seriously in that our platform is meant to inspire cre creativity and, and joy. We're not the place for, for politics or hard news. It's much more lighthearted, as we talked about with each other at the AJC meeting earlier mm -hmm. this year. So it's a, it's a, it's a growing community that, that changes and, and talks about what's happening in the world and, and the exciting things that they're proud to show to their followers and friends on TikTok. And how does it make determinations about what doesn't, what doesn't meet those uh, those standards. So our community guidelines, which are public, they're on our website and on our on our on our app, are are the rules of the road, and we have content moderators and uh, and and you know uh, algorithm algorithm and machine learning to determine what's violative of our community guidelines and what's not. How many content moderators? Uh, thousands in in all around the world. Uh, and the how often does the how often does the algorithm get since since the content standards are a living document, how often does the algorithm change to reflect those changing standards? So the algorithm is, I guess, separate from the community guidelines, and the algorithm also is uh, constantly changing depending on what individual users are viewing on their on their particular feed in concert with, of course, what's allowed and what's not allowed on TikTok, which is very clear and is informed by our work with groups like AJC and others. Right, so that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And this is actually a question for, for all of the groups, uh, all of the companies. So the, the algorithm is the algorithm is gonna change. That We've spent time here in Congress talking about this for a while now. The algorithm changes, but the, alg the algorithm is, is what's driving the, the images to, uh, to our phones. Um, and and it, it does, and it, it effectively sends information that, that the companies that the out forget the companies that the algorithm believes that we want to see. So, at, what's the point? H how how when when it's clear that that what the algorithm is sending is uh, anti-Semitic material, violent extremism, um, racist material? What, what happens when does that when does the algorithm? How does the algorithm change so that it doesn't just continue to feed the most outrageous? anti-Semitic, for our purposes here today, uh, images and content to a user. So speaking for TikTok, our platform is interest-based, which means you're seeing what you're searching for. My, I'm an avid TikTok user, and I share it with my children, and I see content that's of interest to, to me and them. I've never been served a piece of anti-Semitic content. I, I understand. Well, let me, Neil, let me ask you the same question. I understand that you haven't, but some people do, and then they're fed that more and more and more and more. So the question is, at what point does the company realize that the algorithm is, that is doing its job sending people what they want to see is sending them material that has no place on the platform? Uh, Congressman Deutsch, that's a, it's a great question. Our algorithms work in concert, so we have multiple al algorithms, including algorithms that remove content, algorithms that downrank and demote content, including what we call borderline content, and then recommendation algorithms. So we won't recommend someone something that we think is borderline, that is possibly violative of our policies. Um, and then we have the kind of the harder binary uh, 
algorithms that say, yes, this violates and we're going to remove that. And so no one would see it or as minimal uh, people that we can um, hope for. Um, so those are how they work in concert. To the question of how does the algorithm potentially learn, there are machine learning that goes into this as well through our human moderators that do a lot of labeling of content. So they find something to be violating, they will label it as violating for what reason, and then that content then feeds into the machine learning so the algorithm can then right. proceed. Last question, um, Ms. Washington Schultz, and I appreciate that. So, the, so at, at what point, how, does, how do those content moderators define anti-Semitism that would actually cause them to, to tweak the algorithm so that it no longer sends out the kind of vile anti-Semitic trash that so many of us are worried about. Similar to uh, perhaps the other platforms, our community guidelines are also uh, living, breathing. Uh, so we do update our community standards often, and then that is given to our content moderators through, the, through those forms, through guidance, and then they make those decisions to, to uh, ensure that we are training the machine learning going forward. I, I, I'm sorry. I just need to understand yeah. how, how do they train? How do they train the machine learning? How? how what we, is we it? Have, we have. I'm sorry. What, what, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, but I'm just trying to understand what. What is it that they? Ha, is at this point, it's living and breathing. I got it. It's been yeah. living and breathing for it's a every, long time. Is. So, what is it in that living and breathing document that is now identified as anti-Semitism? that then gets fed to change the algorithm so that it no longer gets... Yeah, maybe, maybe if I can use an example. So at, starting with COVID, and so that claim that Jews were the cause of COVID. We updated our policies to say that this is violating of our policies. We give that into our content moderators. The moderators then, they will begin to make that decision. That decision is then fed back into the machine learning that then informs the algorithm that this is also violating. So. We are not relying on moderators or human reports as much. We are relying on the algorithm itself to make the determination that, oh, I know based off of X number of feeds that of people saying that this is violating content, that this is now violating. And then it begins to make those decisions um, for us, or in some cases, route it to a moderator when it, it's uh, a bit more uh, close. Can the moderator, I'm sorry, can, yeah, sure, can the moderator, I, I, we just, we re this is really, really no, important to understand how it works. Does, does the moderator who sees that and flags it as anti-Semitic, anti do they have the ability, to, do they send a, an email to someone or do they send a note to it, algorithms it, at Meta? So, 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 that, so, so there, there's, there's, there are many algorithms. So the algorithms are always working, including on how our moderators yep. actually rate the content. And so what we try to do to remove a lot of subjectivity from our moderators, we want to try to create very objective rules, the rules by our content policy team. So those rules, then the moderators apply those rules that get their decisions for most, or not most, but um, a, perhaps a majority of anti-Semitism comes in the form of hate speech. It would violate our hate speech rules, some violence in other places. And then that will ultimately train what the algorithm uh, or the machine learning does for the algorithm that makes decisions based off of removing the content, violating or not violating, also the recommendations of, of certain content. I hope that, I can always follow up. Uh, right, we can talk some more, but I, I appreciate it very much. Thanks, thanks so much. Jenny. That was important indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. <laughs> okay, next I'd like to recognize for five minutes, uh, Mr. Michael, uh, Ms. Uh, Madeline Hickman from South Africa. Thank you so much. Um, I'm coming to this, this deliberation from a completely different perspective in that it's the first time South Africa is represented. So we have a different perspective in that the greatest proponents of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment comes from our very own government. And because of that, it filters down from the top down instead of coming from the bottom up. And the, in, in 2019, for example, uh, or 2018, 50% of the anti-Semitic messaging actually was anti-Israel sentiment. And it came across and it was so confused within the minds of the, the, the public because it came from the government having such a strong failure to understand the difference between being anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist actually being the same thing, that we had messages um, in the name of Palestine, the Jewish mafia and against Jews all being rolled into one all the time. 
we are very lucky in that we don't have the same level of anti-Semitism in South Africa that you do in the other parts of the world. And the problem for me is that one incident of anti-Semitism is one incident too many. And one in incident of anti-Israel speech is one incident too many. The problem that we have is that it becomes proliferated on Facebook and very definitely in the Twitter space. And it's proliferated when you get a speech that is made either by a minister or one of their acolytes, and it gets proliferated in the, in the main, in the Twitter sphere and on Facebook. And because it comes from a government official or it comes in the guise of a government official, and it speaks about anti-Semitism, anti-Israel sentiment, and because it gets swept up in a wave, what are you doing? Because it is purported to come from a government official, what are you doing to protect the not necessarily educated people who are following these government officials to educate them or to take those tweets down, to take that Facebook post down. It's something, Kevin, that we spoke about yesterday when I spoke to you about the um, Africa for Palestine, the, the, the tweets, the, the Facebook paste, uh, posts are absolutely horrific. They really are calling on uh, freedom for Gaza, the, Israel, this is your chance to make it right. Um, talking about Zionists killing innocent Palestine, Palestinian children, you must be proud of yourself. Uh, these are horrific things. What are you doing to, with your algorithms, with your attempts to pull down these posts, particularly on Twitter, to make South Africans safe, to take away the power of the posts on Twitter and on Facebook? So I'll begin. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we have begun labeling government accounts uh, around the world. We have not labeled South Africa yet, as far as I'm aware. But it, this is something we are looking to do in the future in order to give our users more context on where this speech is coming from, especially if it is coming from uh, governments. We uh, certainly uh, encourage people to turn the algorithm off, which you can do on Twitter, uh, rather than allowing us to surface uh, tweets. Please, you'd follow the tweets that in reverse timeline that are surfaced to you, that you have chosen to follow. Um, there is certainly more work to be done with regard to um, uh, refining our policies, but we also fight this from a trend. Uh, trend perspective uh, and the use of following hashtags. Um, and then we fight this on an individual perspective, also with the use of algorithms that do surface these in a positive way to us, uh, as my colleague from Meta explained, uh, for further examination and action. The gentleman's, the gentlemen's time has expired. Um, I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from South Africa, Mr. Mike, Michael Bagram, for five minutes. Thank you. Following on from that, we have a strange country in the sense that we've just heard that we believe it's anti-Semitic and we believe the government is practicing that. All I'm looking for from all of you is an acknowledgement that Judaism is Zionism. There is no difference. I don't believe there's any difference. I believe that the cornerstone of the Jewish faith is the belief in Zion. And if you believe that, if you feel that that is correct and you understand that, then you're going to understand that the attack on Israel is a problem for us. And it's a problem in the sense that it's not an Israeli policy that we're worried about. We're worried about the existence of the state of Zion, of, the, of, of Zion existing and of being there. Now, the reality is that the BDS movement uh, run by anti-Semites was actually to a large degree coalesced in Durban, a city in South Africa, a few years back. And 
what came out as the cornerstone of that whole movement, the anti-Semitic movement, is a problem that we see that they call it apartheid Israel. In other words, they're taking a hated regime that existed in South Africa, and they've now clothed that with Israel. And the reality is, if you can't see that apartheid Israel as a statement is anti-Semitic, then we've got a problem. And I'm looking for a commitment from all of you to at least go back, have a look at that, investigate that, and come back to us and say, well, you believe apartheid Israel isn't a problem. If that's the case, then we've got, a, we've got an ongoing problem because then the hate speech is going to evolve to the Jew. It has to. And you know that the hate speech always does evolve into violence at the end of the day. So I'm not going to take much time. All I'm looking for is a commitment to look into the fact that Judaism goes hand in glove with Zionism. And I'm looking to you to go into the fact that apartheid Israel is actually condemning the Jew and not Israel itself. Thank you. Is the gentleman concluded? He wants to ask yeah. the question. I think it's actually a question. Yeah, that was a question. So who are you directing your question to, Mr. Begum? I'm directing it to everyone. I want each, each company to say that they recognize that Zionism and Judaism goes hand in glove and that they recognize that Zionism goes hand in glove with Israel. We'll start with you, Ms. Austin. I, we will commit to getting back to you with a more detailed answer. Similarly, we're continuing to have these conversations internally, and we'll be happy to refer back to you on them. We're happy to follow up with you as well. Uh, yes, sir, happy to follow up. And I'd also note um, on YouTube, YouTube's community guidelines apply to everyone equally. So regardless of who may be uploading a video, if content violates our policies, uh, that content will be removed. If the gentleman is finished with his questions? Yes, okay. All right, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, I I'll. I'll just note with some frustration that uh, we came from all over the world to have a legitimate conversation, and I think we've been able to do that. But to have each and every one of you not answer more substantively, uh, the gentleman's question is, uh, is quite frustrating. Are you able to elaborate more on why Zionism uh, w would not be something that would meet the, uh, the gentleman's test that he's asking you about? More elaboration, then you'll just get back to us, since we don't meet very often, would be helpful. As I mentioned uh, in my statement, that uh, uh, religion is included in our hate speech policy as a protected attribute. We also have broad policies around uh, harassment and cyberbullying. So there are multiple uh, uh, avenues of approach that can be taken if content violates these policies that seeks to harass, attack, uh, uh, an individual based upon these protected attributes, that content will be removed. Um, Ms. Cutler Wanch has a, has a question. No, no the frustration is that gentleman. Zionist, of course, is not a religion. We all understand that, except mm -hmm. that Zionist is an integral part of the majority of Jews and many non-Jews. And so when you separate it in that way, of course, you'll never be able to address it, right? So that Zionism is actually when it replaces Jew on every single digital platform, and so I'm not addressing any specific one of you, then we have a problem, and that's what we're here to discuss. And, and Mr. Housefather wants to ask a more pointed question, so we can try to drill down on what information we're looking for you for. Thanks so much. So if somebody, if I were to post on your platform or to make a video, and what I was to say is, Jews are all white nationalists who support apartheid. Would that be taken down, Mr. King? Uh, it's difficult to, to say in the abstract here, but that's definitely something that we would want to look into for violations of our policies. Uh, similar. Uh, we would have to look into that. For It's hard to do it in the hypothetical, but we would look just, into that. Just Jews are white nationalists who support apartheid. That would not fall under your policy unequivocally. Nothing else. That's all it says. Jews are white nationalists who support apartheid or a video, and that's all the person says. That's, that's not hate speech. That's not clearly to you hate speech. Mr. Potts. Mr. Epperson. 
Again, it's, it's difficult to answer in a hypothetical. I will say our community guidelines are clear about hate speech and violent content and bullying, and if it hits one of those metrics, it will be taken down. Ms. Austin? So you're asking for a binary, yes or no. And I think the, uh, the big thing that has been discussed globally from all the envoys is this is not always a binary question, and we would have to measure it against our Twitter rules. Okay, okay so, so it's difficult for me because then the word Zionist replacing Jew in that context. I thought the word Jew would give you an unequivocal answer. Right. And then Zionist, you would say it has to be put into context, but not even the word Jew in that context is necessarily something that you can tell us as executives of companies that you can take down. That's that that that's pretty disturbing. I'm so, sorry to say. So, and and just to ask, no, and just to uh, add to that, uh, just, uh, if it said death to Jews versus death to okay. Zionists, maybe that would be the question. Um, re reclaiming the uh, prerogative of the chair. That's okay. We had time on the left on the gentleman's time, so I wanted to make sure that we could um, be a little more focused. Um, I will just add that I think you're, we're all starting to see, anyone watching this, why we're eventually going to have to regulate the, the, the way that this, these, this content is handled, uh, as opposed to just leaving it to you, uh, the companies, to, uh, to, comply, you know, to, to make sure you're complying with standards that really aren't very transparent. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, now I'd like to take a moment to recognize the gentleman from South Africa, Mr. Darren Bergman, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Look, we had the opportunity yesterday to engage with the uh, with the de various representatives from the various platforms. I used that time productively to ask the questions I wanted to, and then, of course, we've had the opportunity today. I've been covered from my colleagues here. I would then like to take this opportunity to rather make an appeal to the platform that we have here, the task force that we have today, to make an urgent plea while we've got you here and to use this five minutes productively to, to try and move this platform forward, the task force forward, and say that this gathering is long overdue. You know, we need a forum whereby Jewish politicians around the globe can formalize and speak to issues that are affecting our community around anti-Semitism and politics and uh, politicians in their communities and constituencies or even in their, in their own legislatures um, as a result of just being Jewish. You know, um, my colleague spoken about in South Africa where there's only four of us and 400 members of parliament and we are up against people wearing scarves, people always talking about a narrative. We could be talking about the blue scars and we'll be then uh, speaking about Palestine. And We've now, we've now agreed that a code word for, for Zionism is not Zionism as it is. It, that really goes deeper than that. So we cannot just be a talk shop. You know, Jews throughout history, we've been accused of having money. So I assume that we have had money. We've had power because uh, I think academically or taking into account our significance or or, or how small we've been in the world and where the spaces we've occupied, we've, we've, we must have throughout history have also had some, some form of power. And for those that understand the word seichel, we've definitely had seichel for the same reasons. So we've had money, power and seichel throughout history, but we've never ever solved the problem of anti-Semitism. So what makes us think that we are going to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. And the problem is now that enters a new space of social media. So yesterday, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt asked, you know, uttered some very, very scary statistics that are, I think that make Hitler very smug. Um, one billion people have uh, anti-Semitic feelings. And for a group of people that are only make up 0.2% of the population, the global population, that, that, that should really, that should make the hair of any executive of any social media platform that has a responsibility of protecting the, the minorities of any, of any uh, minorities. To hear that statistic, we should be doing whatever we can, whatever, whatever definitions we can. And, and IRA makes it easy for us. IRA gives us a definition. And we should be doing what we can to protect that definition and to enforce that definition. So if we have brains and we have the want for love and peace in our hearts, then we need to use our advantage over those intent on hate and destruction 
by learning these algorithms and by messaging and uh, propositioning uh, the executives here today into us taking advantage of these social media platforms while they still, um, you know, while everyone's still learning them to do what Jews do best. And that is to be the light in the darkness and to spread love when those won't hate. So Chair, Chair, if I may, Chair, I'm talking to you. Chair, if I may, I want to propose that this committee or this task team begins to document all Jewish politicians around the world and ex-politicians or politicians that don't necessarily make it back into their legislatures but are still intent on trying to be part of the solution. Invite them to a Congress and elect a body and agree a founding constitution that will get Jewish politicians to join this fight to combat anti-Semitism globally. I so move that resolution. Thank you very much. I appreciate the suggestion. There, there is actually already an interparliamentary organization um, of Jewish ministers and members of parliament. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I definitely can uh, reach out and make sure you get the information to be able to join. Thank you so much. Did you um, did you have any uh, expressed questions? No. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Um, now I'd like to recognize uh, for five minutes of questions, Ms. Glynis Breitenpack from uh, South Africa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to latch on to the question by Mr. Bagram, but I'd like a much more definitive answer from each of you. So I want to know what you do or what you will do to ensure that hidden or embedded anti-Semitism contained particularly in criticism of the State of Israel or particularly anti-Zionist uh, criticism, is detected and removed, and why are globally identified, objectively, anti-Semitic individuals allowed to have a continued presence on your platforms? I'd like each one of you to answer me, please. I'm certainly, uh, YouTube is committed to working with organizations around the world uh, to understand uh, new trends in, in terms of hate and harassment, and we are continued, uh, uh, committed to making sure that we continue to, to update our community guidelines uh, as we need to. We're also committed to continuing uh, to, to work with uh, uh, raters around the world using our publicly available rating guidelines on content to help us make sure that YouTube is not recommending uh, borderline content. And we're also uh, uh, committed to making sure that we provide transparency in uh, working with researchers around the world and certainly want to make sure if there are additional steps that can be taken uh, to allow research access while at the same time uh, safeguarding user privacy, more than happy to have those conversations to ensure uh, that the public, that legislators, uh, that, that individuals around the world uh, have information to help keep uh, people safe online and to combat this type of hate. I'm sorry, may I just, would you also add on why people are allowed a continued presence on your platform? YouTube has robust enforcement policies where there are, we, we call it our three strikes policy. Uh, in the event if someone violates uh, or has content removed three times within 90 days, they are permanently suspended. And again, those community guidelines apply to everyone equally on YouTube. Thank you, Spring Back. Um, for the question, I guess briefly, just to take a step back here at Meta, we do have strong policies against hate speech, which we define as direct attacks against people based off of their protected characteristics. And we recognize that words and the evolving of language, that words can be used as proxies, or there may be things like dog whistles or veiled threats. And we have policies that try to address these too. So when we are clear, or we are aware, I should say, that a word may be used to insinuate or cover up an attack against someone based off of them being Jewish, based off of them being Israeli, we will remove that content. Um, likewise, we do believe in strong partnerships and we have a, a very robust external stakeholder team that carries out the conversations with academics and civil society to make sure that we are drawing lines in the right place. And then we believe in our product as well to make sure that we are removing as much content before people see that or before it's reported, and then also not recommending that um, to people that may be violative. Please don't forget to tell me why people are allowed to have a continued presence on your platform. Which, I'm, I'm sorry, which people are, are you referring to? 
uh, serial violators? Why are they allowed to continue uh, to be? I think like all the platforms here, we do have policies for uh, those that uh, essentially exceed a number of violations where you are ultimately having your platform, or excuse me, your access to the platform disabled. For certain individuals, including those that are terrorists or hate organizations, uh, for example, we ban over 270 hate organizations, white supremacist, white uh, nationalist organizations. Those people can't even have uh, a presence on the platform to say that, oh, happy birthday to my loved one. No matter what they say, we find them to be um, so abhorrent that we want them off the platform and we disable their accounts. For others that just have other types of violation, whether they're nudity, hate speech, um, calls for violence, they will then, after a number of violations, we will remove their accounts as well. Thank you for the question. TikTok is a diverse and inclusive community, so we don't have any tolerance for discrimination or hate speech. We evaluate the content as we see it, as it is against our community guidelines. So if it's, you know, threatens violence against or dehumanizes an individual or group or has hate speech that's either rhetorical in nature or physical in nature, we're going to remove that account. We're going to remove that content, uh, irrespective of, of the group that they belong to. And if, you know, again, similarly, we have moderation policies or if someone competes, uh, has repeated offenses, we'll take, you know, action against them and we'll remove them from the platform if that's appropriate. Thank you for the question. Uh, similar to my colleagues, we, uh, we have the same approach with regard to uh, taking down accounts and to actioning content. All individuals accessing or using Twitter services must adhere to the policies set forth in Twitter's rules, and you will often, as a user, see the action that we have taken on the account when you search for that content. Thank you so much. Uh, the gentlelady yields back. Her time has expired. Uh, and uh, finally, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Sweden representing the European Parliament, Mr. David Lega, for his five minutes of questions. Oh, there, thank you. And that one, too? Ah, better. So the main advantage of being last interviewer in a hearing like this is to actually have time to ponder and think about the answers and the, the discussion you heard. So I usually wind up with completely different questions that I intended to ask. Um, and the, the first one that came to mind would be, I mean, we as legislators, we often talk about the purpose of the laws, just like you do with the rules. I mean, naturally to protect citizens, to protect users, but also the signal value of the rule that you, you actually put up that shows the values of the country, the company that we all adhere to. So my first question would be regarding the IRA definition. And to, to you, Ms. Austin, from Twitter, that the discussion has been that you think that you, you believe that you cover uh, the IRA definition in your hate uh, uh, rules and the other. So do you also feel that you are fulfilling that from the value perspective? Can you explain value to me? The values that we adhere to in a democracy, human values. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, we have the rules as we discussed. Uh, we have the definitions. We also have a trust and safety council. We also work extensively with human rights activists in order to ensure that we are reflecting um, the values with regard to uh, how this um, content is appearing on platform. So yeah, my, my we uh, we do our best to uh, rep to incorporate these. Values. My, sorry, my my question was more your thoughts on how Twitter is actually following and respecting and leading the values of a country or a company who wants to have a no anti-Semitism policy. Twitter is the preferred platform for human rights activists. So uh, we are greatly honored by this presence of these activists on platform. And we are doing our best to make sure that that uh, conversation is safe and well heard. So um, we are. Uh, we certainly take that into account in our everyday actions. I hope that you will take more into account the, the real purpose of the IRA definition, not only to punish people, but also to show what we are willing to do and where we're willing to go. And to you, Mr. Ebenstein from, from TikTok, 
We have the EU strategy in, uh, within the European Union that combines combating anti-Semitism but also protecting the Jewish way of life to see those two as two important pillars that work together. Um, could you tell us what you do concretely within TikTok to not only combat anti-Semitism but also to protect the Jewish way of life? Certainly. So I think we've talked at length about moderation, and that's one of the main ways in which we combat anti-Semitism. To protect Jewish life is something we do in a number of different ways, be it uh, memorializing Holocaust Remembrance Day, partnering with groups like AJC and, and ADL and others, having content like that of uh, um, the, our, the Holocaust survivor and her family talking about that the, you know her experiences and what went on, um, having resources uh, authoritative resources about the Holocaust so that if you search for something on the Holocaust, you automatically have a banner that says, come here if you want to have authoritative uh, information about the Holocaust. And similarly, and this kind of I think bridges both of your questions, if you try to search for something that Holocaust didn't exist or some, some search term, term that would indicate denial of, of the Holocaust, you're going to get a, a zero response and you're going to get a redirection to authoritative guidelines on what Thank happened. You. Also to, to Mr. Potts, Facebook um, or Meta. Um, the special envoy Tishby elaborated the connection made in anti-Semitic comments between Israel and, and Jews. And I can only confirm that to be true. In, in Sweden, we have numbers that say that 86% of the population in Sweden, their views on Jews are affected by their thoughts on the states, on the actions of the state of Israel. 86%. That's the highest number in, in Europe. So could you tell me how you adapt algorithm and counter messages to the different continents? Because this must be different in different parts of the world. We actually, I want to try to take a step back. Thank you for the question. Um, Sir um, on that, we actually have global policies, and we try to apply those policies in that manner. However, we do use market expertise um, through our human reviewers where appropriate to bring in more context of local um, local norms, the way that speech is developing in, in different areas, so that we can adjust and excuse me, adjust and address issues as they arrive. I don't know if that completely answers your question, but I'm also not sure I, I fully understand it. Yeah, my, my point is that different ways, uh, different types of anti-Semitism arise in different parts of the world. So how do you? Actually oh, no, that, that, that's that? fair. I think that is the number one way that we we address that is through our, the use of our market teams or our human reviewers that can provide more context. But we also have these robust stakeholder engagement teams that meet with civil society, like the academy, and that is global as well. Yeah. Uh, so whether based in Europe, based in South Asia, based in Singapore, globally, as, as I mentioned, seeking that feedback that we can then inform our global policy so that we can apply that and capture the whole swell of that um, problematic content. Yeah, I would love to hear more on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lega. Um, before we conclude, I, I do want to take a moment to uh, to just help us understand the scope of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, each of you today discussed that you take down most of, you have policies that ensure that, um, you know, in the case of Meta, 90% 90, 90 of uh, prohibited posts are never even seen by anyone. Um, but according to the Center for Countering Digital Hate, who produced this report, Failure to Protect, How Tech Giants Fail to Act on User Reports of Anti-Semitism, this page, page seven, documents that they recorded and reported 714, only 714 anti-Semitic posts that were seen by up to 7.3, uh, seen up to 7.3 million times. So I'd like unanimous, unanimous consent to enter this report and highlight this page specifically to help understand the scope of the problem. Um, it's very clear that you are only scratching the surface. And um, can I just also add, as much as I, and, and I assume I have heard no objections, so we'll enter that into the record. I, I hope you don't take, I hope you take this comment in the way that it's went. I appreciate you joining us today. I know we all do. We've all made a, a lot of effort and invested a lot of time uh, into uh, putting together today's hearing. But each of you in some way mentioned your pride in acknowledging Yom HaShoah uh, and other specific Jewish holidays. And frankly, so often that comes off as pandering. 
um, and, and mentioning those kinds of acknowledgments as somehow being emblematic of how seriously you take the concerns of the Jewish community. Anti-Semitism is a viral, toxic infection that drives real world violence. And for you to only scratch the surface or to pander um, and use examples of, you know, some of your, like, like some of your best friends are Jews is, uh, is, is, is insulting and frustrating. So I would just suggest in the future when you're testifying on this topic that perhaps you might not want to use those kinds of examples and be more specific and, uh, and intentional about being forthcoming in your responses. Okay, with that said, I know each of us have one minute to give an, a closing statement. I do wanna thank all of our witnesses representing their companies for joining us for this vital hearing. Um, we hope you understand the need for candor today. We appreciate you answering uh, as specifically as you felt you could, and we look forward to continuing the discussion. So we'll conclude today's hearing with one minute closing statements from each of our members, and we'll start in reverse order. So uh, so uh, our, our gentleman from the European Parliament, Parliament, Mr. David Lega, will recognize for one minute. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, and thank you to my dear colleagues, and naturally to also to all the panelists being here today. It's very important. And I, I think it's clear for everyone that we do have a long way to go in combating online anti-Semitism. And Special Envoy Lipstadt said it too in the beginning, what's illegal offline needs to be illegal on, uh, online. Did I say it the wrong way? No. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but therefore, we must act as powerful as we would have offline whenever addressing these issues. And it is a global issue, so it needs to be addressed globally. And the trans transatlantic link is vital in this and so many other perspectives. So thank you so much for also taking care of that link in this uh, uh, task force. So one more is that don't try to reinvent the wheel. We know so many other organizations who had the same issue in social media, for example, combating child sexual abuse online. We have the means on how to do this well. So let us try to find inspiration and knowledge from other organizations and do it together with them too. So with that, a warm thank you to the special envoys, to the panelists, and especially to Congresswoman Wasserman Schulz and to Mr. House Father for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Glynis Breitenbach from South Africa, you're recognized for um, one minute. Uh, thank Close. you very much. I'd like to thank the participants in this uh, proceeding. I know that you're not obliged to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved in coordinating and running this event, uh, and uh, particularly for the invitation extended to South African members of parliament. Uh, Israel is often compared to apartheid South Africa, something we know from our own lived experience is not true. Uh, but this forms only part of a rising, increasingly overt anti-Semitism. BDS is alive and well and operating in South Africa, and uh, an insidious, cynical, and increasing online anti-Semitism is noticeable in our country. We need to act against it now. It's encouraging to know that we will not be fighting this battle in isolation or alone. So thank you to everybody on this panel for, uh, for including us. Uh, and we remain grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Darren Bergman from South Africa for one minute to close. Thank you. Um, look, Jews can have a thousand positive, newsworthy, and world-changing events a day. But with the fight for social media space, one or two faux pas or fake items can cancel it for everyone. And I cannot stress how grateful our delegation is for a forum like this. It's, I don't know whether to be disappointed, embarrassed, or ashamed that we didn't know about uh, the, the parliamentarians forum, or maybe politics in South Africa, Jewish politics in South Africa is alive and well. Um, but in South Africa, there's an anti-Israel space, as my colleague has, uh, has, has mentioned, that, that we are continuously uh, fighting in. And I, com I commit myself to be a productive member of this of, of, of this group, and already as a board member of ICANN in America, of BPUR, which is a, a, a committee that stamps out religious exploitation in politics and is something obviously very close to this, and a vice president of Liberal International, 
you have my assurance that I'm always a soldier in this fight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Madeline Hicklin from South Africa, you're recognized for one, one minute to close. We are gathered here as legislators, as concerned citizens, as Jews, as human beings to boldly say never again and mean it. My grandchildren are fortunate. They know their cousins, their uncles, their aunts. I never had that privilege, with very few exceptions. They are my mother's brother's two daughters. My mother and her brother escaped from Poland with her parents when my mother was five and her brother was two. Three other members of her family also fled and joined them. The rest were wiped out in Warsaw and Vilna ghettos and in Hitler's concentration camps. My, mother's, my other cousins are from my father's side of the family and they are from the UK and the USA or from South Africa. Martin Neimuller entrusted us to act with haste before it was too late. He famously said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. They came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. They came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. I declare I am a South African Jew, a member of the Democratic Alliance, and I am speaking out on behalf of many South Africans. I am saying Jewish by birth, proud by choice. I am saying never again. I am saying never again. It is up to me, it is up to you, it is up to us. Hatred is a learned behavior and it stops here. I thank you. Thank you so much. Next, uh, to rec recognize for one minute to close, Simon O'Connor from New Zealand. Uh, to thank you, Madam uh, Chair, um, and also to uh, Anthony Housefather for pulling this uh, together. It's uh, an honor to join you all here uh, today, certainly from the other side of the world, and look to thank um, all those who presented from our envoys, uh, those on TV, and those uh, from our social media platforms. Um, I'm very conscious of a, a Jewish philosopher, Martin Buber, who talks about treating people as other and the dangers which come uh, from that. And at the heart of anti-Semitism is this other, which causes immense harm. Uh, it's present, unfortunately, in my own country. Um, and important to say, even in some of my uh, MP colleagues, uh, which is an absolute shame. And why I mention that is they also propagate their anti-Semitic views across your platforms. But I want to say that because it's a dual responsibility. Yes, your platforms are used, but they too have a responsibility. And I think that's a really important aspect. I want to end, though, with something um, positive from my uh, side. Uh, and that's uh, an encouragement from the late uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, who talked about the creativity of the Jewish community, is how they have flourished despite trying circumstances um, over the years, over many, many years. Um, and just to say that perhaps it's that creativity together, be it as politicians, social media platforms, and society as a whole, uh, that we'll find a good, creative, genuine, and right way forward. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Connor. Next, Michael Levitt for one minute to close. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. In today's world, the impact of social media platforms is indisputably titanic. But with power and prominence comes responsibility and accountability, which you, the executives of these massive companies, have been derelict in your duty to do right. Inaction is complicity in the tragic consequences of an online anti-Semitism going unchecked. The vile, unregulated, racist content on the dark corners of your social media platforms are increasingly spilling onto our streets, into our communities, onto our campuses and schoolyards, with real-life threats to our safety, freedom, and ultimately undermining our very way of life. We see this corrosive, poisoning virus of Jew hatred increasingly Im infecting Canadian society, with Jews being the most targeted minority. This tsunami of hate and incitement represent a fundamental risk to our future. I failed to hear a real and meaningful commitment from any of you today 
beyond platitudes and window dressing. I implore you to do more and to do it now. The safety and future of our Jewish community depends on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and forgive me, Michael Bagram from the South, South Africa for one minute to close. Thank you. The anti-Semite is a virus. Viruses mutate. I was not surprised to see non-committal from each one of you when I said that Judaism is Zionism. You didn't know that. You probably won't know that, and I'm not sure how you're going to tackle it. But they've seen it. The anti-Semite has seen that. The world sees Jews as Zionists. They don't differentiate between the two. So it's easy to bypass your systems completely. And they'll continue bypassing your systems until you look at it and recognize the mutation. All I'm asking is for you to go back, have a look at it, have a look at what the anti-Semite is actually doing, and to see that that virus has mutated and actually escaped your, your, your barriers that you've put forward to protect your hate speech. Because the hate speech is there, it never gets stopped. It's easy to say, I hate Israel, and then to explain how they hate Zionists. And the world then sees that as an attack on Jews. And as soon as we come to that and we understand the virus, we're not going to be able to stop it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bagram. And now Michael Michal Kotler Wansh from Israel. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my fellow task force members, those that are here and those that are actually not because they're in faraway countries. And I want to thank the representatives of the platforms. I know it's not a simple task to come here and to engage in this conversation. And I do believe that you all think that this is an important and worthy discussion that we are having. I want to underscore that we're here to talk about not just anti-Semitism online, but about its real world implications for thousands of individuals that are experiencing real world harm, real world harassment, real world intimidation. The case study of the toxic mutation of anti-Semitism enabled by systematic appropriation, weaponization, and selective application of foundational principles that we refer to and institutions and mechanisms of international law and human rights that we refer to expose and shed light on processes that undermine and threaten the foundations of democracies. It can serve to enhance vital understanding of the processes that enable and empower terror regimes and organizations committed to the destruction of democracies generally and that identify and utilize their strengths as weaknesses. It is abundantly clear, including after this conversation, that in a digital reality, the comprehensive IRA working definition of anti-Semitism is a critical resource informing and enabling to identify and combat its current mutated form and empowering to predict, prepare, and prevent real world violence and harm. Without defining anti-Semitism, it's impossible to identify and combat it. Transparency that we've discussed is critical not only to predict and combat rising anti-Semitism online and protect from that real world harm that it generates, but to address growing distrust threatening the very fabric of societies. As a first and critical step, I implore you to get back to this task force with what has become very clear, and that is the need to, uh, to address the, real, the rising real world harm and compromise safety of Jews on campuses and on streets most of whom define themselves as Zionist, coded language for Jew, and as an integral part of their identity, as well as non-Jews who identify as Zionists. It is imperative to add Zionist to the list of protected characteristics that exist in existing hate speech policies on all of the platforms, affording all those who self-define as Zionists the very same, no more, no less, treatment and protection as any other protected characteristic on your platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anthony House, father, for one minute to close. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. I want to end on a note of optimism. We sit here in the halls of Congress in the most powerful democracy in the world. We sit here as legislators, as people who have the power to affect change. Jews have fled to this country for over 350 years, and we all represent countries where Jews have come seeking freedom, seeking opportunity, seeking equality. And in all of our countries, we have achieved that. We've achieved success beyond our ancestors' wildest dreams. And so when it comes to overcoming anti-Semitism, no matter how strong it is and how much it mutates over time, 
we know that we can win. And we do it not only because we are many of us Jews, but because we have lots of non-Jewish allies in all of our countries. We don't sit in countries where we're isolated as Jews. We sit in countries where the vast majority of people of all faiths and those of no faith embrace us and want to end and eradicate anti-Semitism. And I know that is true for all of the people here representing the platforms and all of the people who are in this room. And we just need to work together to achieve that. I know we can do it. We've achieved a lot before. We can do it again. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a glasses half full person, and I recognize myself for five minutes, uh, for one minute to close. <laughs> no, no, no. One is good. One is good. I'm really great, grateful for the chance for us all to be here and thank the platforms for joining us for our inaugural, inaugural in person uh, hearing this year. Um, the effort that it took for so many of you uh, to be here, as well as the work that took place behind the scenes. Thanks so much to our staff, mine, Michal's, and Anthony's uh, in particular. Um, we, we appreciate it so much. Um, for me, this fight is personal. I'm the first Jewish woman to represent Florida in the United States Congress. Um, my family and I know what it's like to feel anti-Semitism, even though I have always lived in a significant and large Jewish community. And on my watch, I will not allow the repeat of the anti-Semitic horrors that my own children have faced by being attacked on social media directly because of their Judaism. And I will not allow that to go unanswered. That, the, the rhetoric that we deal with all the time, that Jews deal with all the time on, on social media, aims to dehumanize and delegitimize the Jewish people. This task force is a perfect example of the opportunity and responsibility that we have as legislators, that you have as platforms, to translate our stated values into action. And we're not alone in our quest. Just yesterday, during the White House United We Stand Summit, President Biden said we need to hold social media companies accountable for spreading hate. He even called on Congress to get rid of special immunity, because you're not bulletin boards anymore that have no responsibility for the content that is shared on your platforms to end your special immunity and create stronger transparency requirements on all of your platforms, which I support. And that was followed up, thankfully, with commitments from some tech companies to take steps to combat online extremism by removing more violent content and promote media literacy with young users. And I appreciate that each of your companies have policies to do that. That's progress. But enforcement, your enforcement is the key to avoid our enforcement. And, they, and your policies cannot allow hate speech, lies, and violent rhetoric to flourish on your sites. And before we adjourn, I especially want to thank the special envoys who are committed you know, so deeply and personally uh, and professionally to their task, um, who joined us in person and remotely, and just thank you for the work that you do every single day to engage in the fight against the oldest hate that really has continued to infect this world inexplicably. And thank you to the representatives from Meta, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube to, who updated on, on us on their work today. We do look forward to getting the do-outs that you committed to us today, and you can be sure that we'll follow up with you to, uh, to get that information. And last but not least, I want to say what a privilege it is to work with each and every one of the parliamentarians here, and I look forward to the work ahead. Thank you so much. And with that, the task force stands adjourned. <laughs>